Um, well, again, uh, thanks everyone for, for joining uh, the session. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about Cyanohab's monitoring detection. Um, the, uh, the session is gonna run from 2.30 to five. We're gonna take the first few minutes to kind of give an overview of the session, give some ground rules, give some background on OLA. And then I, I think the first talk will get going around 2.40. Um, let's see here. Let's see if I can get this moving here. Um, just, just briefly about the Oregon Lakes Association. I think several, uh, many people on the this call probably are have, are members or, or or know about the Oregon Lakes Association. But just for some background for those who may not be uh, familiar with the organization, um, it's been around now well for 31 years, so um, not quite middle age, but get get in there. Um, there are a number of uh, it's a pretty wide range of uh, of membership um, membership group. There's people just recreationalists, property owners. Uh, many people from public agencies, uh, universities, nonprofits, uh, local, uh, so you know, local like associations, um, and, and environmental consultants are members. Um, we are, um, we do several different types of activities uh, throughout the state. Um, we include we that includes uh, providing annual student scholarships, uh, which um, you, we send out announcements for and, and provide and provide a, a amount of money for research and and um, and travel to, to conferences. Um, we also have uh, an annual harmful algal bloom workshop that uh, Theo Dreyer, the uh, president uh, of the, the association, hosts uh, along with OS OSU um, every, uh, I'd say, winter and winter to spring, depending on the, the timing each year. Uh, and, and for those who are not members, I would uh, encourage you to go check out o uh, the Oregon Lakes Association website and, and look at uh, membership. It's not that expensive to join, and I think it's uh, it's a pretty useful local organization uh, to, to be a part of. Um, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm a, one of the board members of the association. Um, I want to thank uh, the sponsors of OLA, the corporate sponsors. Um, we have several tiers of sponsorship, uh, gold sponsorship, silver and, and bronze. Um, I think CB3, um, IXOM Water Care, Bio, uh, BioSafe Systems, FICO Tech, and uh, Eureka Water Probes. Um, so for today's session, as I mentioned, it's, it's focused on Cyano uh, Hab's um, monitoring detection, and we have a, a pretty good slate of talks. Um, I, I do want to point out um, at uh, three uh, the, the talk, the third talk in the session uh, has, has been canceled because of a, a of an issue with um, uh, travel. So uh, last minute issue with travel. So in that time. Um, Myself, Theo Dreyer, and maybe some others who are familiar with uh, legislation going on in Oregon with, with Santa Habs will give a brief update on what's going on with funding within uh, the, uh, the state agencies. Um, but you know, Bernadelle is going to lead us off, uh, followed by Tom. Uh, Chippy Kislik, is, is, are you on the, the call? I haven't seen you on the, on the screen yet. Yep, I'm here. Oh, okay, excellent, great, cool. Uh, followed by myself, I'm going to talk a bit about a project I've been working on with DEQ for the past several years. Uh, and then followed by Alyssa um, and Kelly, and then concluding with uh, Amalia Handler, who's been working with the EPA on uh, some satellite imagery uh, of Sion Uh So uh, just for some guidelines, some of you probably have uh, seen the, the posting already, but we are recording this session and we're gonna post this on the OLA website, just to, for you to be aware. Um, we have 20 minute slots for the speakers, but we really wanna focus on having the speakers give 15 minute talks and reserve five minutes for, for questions to allow people to interact with the speakers. Um, what I would ask is uh, for everyone on the call to turn off their video, uh, unless you are um, uh, speak, one of the speakers, um, um, just so we can save bandwidth for people who may be experiencing issues with that. Um, just for speakers individually, I'm gonna give you, um, uh, speakers uh, warnings at, at the 13 minute mark that you have two minutes left and then at the 15 minute mark that you need to, to wrap up your talk. Um, in terms of questions, um, I think we, many of us are pretty familiar with Zoom now after being in this for about almost two years, but uh, in the reactions tab at the bottom, you can raise your hand uh, and I will, I can call, I'll, I'll call on you to, to ask your question. Um, you're also, you can also type your question in the chat box and I'll, I'll read that to the, to the speaker. Um, I want, I want to remind folks that we this is the first of three sessions that we have planned currently uh, for the fall. Um, next week, uh, we have our annual uh, OLA business meeting from 2.30 to 3. And following that up, Desiree uh, Tulos is going to chair a session on lake physiology and management, uh, which should be pretty interesting. And, and for specific session details, you can visit the OLA website. And then on Wednesday, December 1st, uh, Ron Larson is going to uh, chair a session um, 
our beautiful lakes past and present. And again, you can go online to see the, um, uh, the, the lineup for that. Um, so with that, um, does anyone have any questions before we get started or, or comments? Theo, do you have anything you wanna follow up um, about OLA or anything else? No, Dan, thanks, I don't. Okay. Um, let's see here. So we have about, that took a little bit shorter time than I expected. We have about four minutes to go. Um, why don't, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And hold on a second. Not really sure what's going on here. Hold on one second. Second. That's what the problem is. There we go. Now I'm back. That's, that's why I have a little bit extra time so I can figure out when I'm messing up on Zoom. Um, so, um, well, why don't we go ahead and get started so we don't waste anyone's time. We can be a few minutes ahead of schedule to accommodate any, uh, any um, um, carryover. So, um, Bernadelle, um, we can get going um, with your presentation. I think you just need to share your screen. And I'll, I'll send something specific to you in the chat when about the timing, just as a, as a, as a warning. Okay, sounds great. Okay, so just verifying that you can see the, the presentation correctly. I can see it, yes. Okay, great, and that's the one that's just the full screen, not the split screen. Yes, it's the full okay. screen, yep. Okay, great. All right, yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Bernadette Garstecki. I'm a research assistant at Portland State University. Um, I recently graduated at P PSU uh, with a Master's of Science in Environmental Engineering, um, and this presentation is going to be on my thesis that I did on modeling cyanotoxin production, state and transport, in surface water bodies. So I'll start with an introduction, um, toxin overview, and then move into model development, uh, code updates to the SQL W2 source code, testing, and then end with conclusions and some continuing research. So the issues, um, cyanobacteria, similar to algae, can cause blooms, which cause eutrophication or excessive nutrients in water bodies. Um, and unlike algae, cyanobacteria can also produce toxins, um, and in severe cases, that can lead to death. So this poses a risk for both our drinking water and our recreational water. So the objective of my research was to model toxin transport and fate using an existing model, C called W2. It's a two-dimensional hydraulic and water quality model, so that we can uh, help limit exposure, mitigate health risks, um, and evaluate management strategies. So there is some difficulty in classifying cyanobacteria. Uh, not all genera produce toxins, and a genus or species may contain both toxic and non-toxic strains. Um, some factors that affect blooms are temperature and nutrients, um, and the magnitude and frequency of blooms is expected to increase um, with increasing temperatures due to climate change and agricultural runoff. In Oregon, there are four main toxins of concern, microcystin, cylindrous bromopsin, anatoxin A, and saxotoxin. I'll focus on the first two since those are currently being regulated by the Oregon Health Authority. So microcystin is a hepatotoxin, uh, which means that it affects the liver. It mostly exists as an intracellular toxin, um, where the extracellular portion is typically less than 30% of the total microcystin concentration. Cylindrous bromopsin is a cytotoxin, which means it affects several organs. Um, and in contrast to microcystin, it mostly exists as an extracellular toxin or dissolved in the water column. Um, this is likely due to active release or leaking from the cells, um, where the microcystin extracellular pool is likely only due to cell lysis or cell death. Uh, anatoxin A and saxotoxin are both neurotoxins that affect the nervous system. So to start um, the model development, um, I began with the C equal W2 cyanobacteria source sink term. Uh, this is the same equation that's used to model algae as well, where S sub A would be the change in cyanobacteria concentration over time. And this is a function of parameters um, such as growth, respiration, excretion, mortality, uh, as well as losses due to settling and zooplankton grazing. For the preliminary model development for the toxins, I simplify this equation to only consider those parameters that are directly related to the cyanobacteria. Um, so left out the settling and grazing um, just for the preliminary analysis, but they'll be included in the, the final version. 
So using that equation for the cyanobacteria um, sourcing term, I developed these two um, terms for the intracellular and extracellular toxins. So S sub intra would be the change in intracellular toxin over time, and then S sub extra would be the extracellular toxin over time. And the intracellular is a direct um, function of the amount of cyanobacteria present. The first part of the equation is exactly that from the previous slide, um, but I've also multiplied it now by this term beta. So beta is the ratio of intracellular toxin mass to cyanobacteria mass. Um, and for this, for the initial model, that beta term is a constant value. And I can talk about that more a little bit later. And then there's also losses due to leakage, uh, intracellular decay, and active release. And then the extracellular uh, equation has similar terms, um, but also now includes uh, extracellular uh, decay or external decay. And I'll point out that all of these terms, or a lot of these terms, the leakage, um, intracellular decay, active release, I don't have values for those. Um, I didn't find anything in literature, um, but these are the kind of my hypothesized uh, rates and terms that would be included in these equations. There are ranges of values for the beta term and the um, extracellular decay term for a variety of different environmental parameters. So I used those two models um, and then plugged in values and compared them to some published literature data. Uh, on the left is microcystin, and on the right is salinous peroxin, um, just to show that kind of proof of concept that the models I developed um, had similar trends um, and orders of magnitude to um, some published data, and uh, which, which they did. So then after the preliminary testing, I incorporated the equations into the C equal W2 source code. Uh, so the top box shows the original equations that I showed previously. And then the bottom box are the equations updated for use in the C equal W2 code. And so as I mentioned, since a lot of these terms, we don't know values for them. I didn't want to have a bunch of terms with kind of assumed values, so I kind of lumped them together. But the intracellular equation now, instead of being a rate term, um, it's just a lump sum at each time step where you would recalculate it based off of how much cyanobacteria you have, B sub A, at the time step, multiply by that same beta term, and then I now introduce a CTP term, which is the fraction of algal group or cyanobacteria group producing a toxin. I'll talk about that on the next slide. And the extracellular equation um, is similar to what it was before, but I've um, combined the excretion, leakage, and active release terms all into this one key release term, and then as well as there's uh, the extracellular decay. So in addition to the source code updates, um, I also made updates to the control file, which is where the user would go in and input all the different coefficients, constants, rates for all the different parameters that you are modeling in your system. So what I have shown here is just for microsystem, but the same four rows uh, would be repeated um, for the other three toxins. And so the, the terms that are shown in red, those are what you would input into this um, sheet. And so that CTP term that I mentioned before, that's the fraction of the group, um, cyanobacteria group, that would produce that toxin. And so in the example shown here, there are three algal groups, ALG1, 2, and 3, in this model, where 1 and 2, say 1, are diatoms, group 2 are the greens, and then group 3 is the cyanobacteria. So the CTP would be 0 for the first two groups. And then for this example, uh, it would be 0.5 for the cyanobacteria, indicating that I expect half of my population in my system to be a producer of microcystin. The other half could maybe produce a different toxin or just um, consist of strains that don't produce toxins. And there's spots for the, the beta term, the release rate, and then the extracellular decay. So once everything was incorporated into the code, I tested it on Henry Hag Lake. Um, I had an existing model set up. It's about 30 miles to the west of Portland. Um, and this figure shows uh, the longitudinal segments of the system for the model. And the results I'll be presenting are taken from uh, segment 29 is just before the Hag Lake Dam up on the bottom right. So for the testing um, of the model, I went through four different scenarios to test for sort of general um, model functionality. So the first one is decay only, uh, no production to make sure that the decay rates are working appropriately. Uh, the second one was decay in production by only um, cyanobacteria death or cell lysis for one group. Uh, the third scenario looks at production by both death and release for one group. And then the fourth one looks at um, death and release. Now I've incorporated all three of the out groups um, as then cyanobacteria groups that produce toxins to make sure that it's able to sum together toxins from different, um, different groups. 
So um, fortunately for Headlake, unfortunately, on a model calibration standpoint, there wasn't a lot of toxin data available. Um, so for microcystin, I, the simulation was over seven years, and I only have four instances um, in one year of microcystin detection um, of values of 0.15 to 0.43 nanograms per milliliter with a detection limit of 0.15. And then, of course, when you um, there were only no detects uh, with a detection limit of 0.05. So I wasn't able to draw sort of concrete um, comparisons between the field data and the model results, but I use these um, the field data as a general range of values to, to look for in the model. So for scenario one, this is looking at decay only, uh, no production. So I started with an initial concentration in the system of 10 nanograms per milliliter, um, microsystem decay rate of 0.1 per day, and cylinders per lapse of 0.05. I mean, the results are what I would expect. Um, microsystem decays quicker than cylinders pomopsin, and they both go to zero since there's, there's no production in the system. For scenario two, um, I've now introduced, um, or I'm sorry, so this is looking at decay and then production by only death. So the release rate um, shown in the table is set to zero for both toxins, uh, starting with an initial concentration of zero. Um, again, these are what I would expect um, as the cyanobacteria populations grow in the summer, both concentrations increase um, and then uh, dwindle during the winter as the population, cyanobacteria population moves away. Um, and then for scenario three, this is the same as the previous one, but I've now um, also introduced a release rate. Um, so I chose 0.01 for microcystin and 0.03 for cylinders from opsin. Uh, again, starting with an initial concentration of zero. These are very similar to the previous slide, um, but they're all slightly higher, which I would expect since I've now introduced release as another source of toxin. For microcystin, I chose 0.01, that's close to the excretion rate for the release rate. And for cylinder smopsin, I chose 0.03, um, so a little bit higher, since I know that cylinder smopsin likely um, there is active release uh, or leakage for that toxin. So this slide is looking at that same scenario in a little more detail. Um, we have microcystin on the left and then cylinders pomopsin on the right. And then the top two graphs show the percent of the total toxin for each of the extracellular and intracellular pools. So for microcystin, the majority of the time, um, microcystin is found to be in the um, intracellular pool and about 50-50 in the summer, um, and then more intracellular in the winter for cylinders pomopsin. Um, similar in the winter, it's found to be more in the I'm sorry, in the winter, it's found to be more in the intracellular pool. And then the majority of the time in the summer, it's the model predicts it to be in the extracellular pool. And these are similar to what I would expect for these toxins. Uh, microcystin more often found to be intracellular and then cylinders from opsin is more often found in the extracellular pool. And I think the reason that in the winter, the intracellular is so much higher as due to sort of dilution and mixing in the system that uh, flushes out the extracellular quicker than the intracellular can produce it. And then lastly, for scenario four, this is looking at decay in production uh, by death and release, not for all three um, of the groups. And so similar results to previously, but now all of these concentrations are a bit higher, which again, I would expect um, that all of my groups are toxin producers. So this table shows a range of values um, for those four different terms, um, both from literature, as well as um, values that I came up with during model calibration. So that CTP term would be water body dependent, um, determined by whatever species or strains are present and what information you have on your system. Um, and then the CTR, the release rate, um, for all of the toxins except for cylinders bromopsin, I have those set to about zero to one times the excretion rate. And then for cylinders bromopsin, maybe one to two times the excretion rate, um, since again, it's um, likely to be um, actively released or, um, or leakage might occur. These are sort of the preliminary values that I that I have right now, but may change as I get more um, data to compare to. So the SQL W2 source code has been updated. Um, the current version does include these toxin models. Uh, the preliminary testing matched um, published literature values, uh, relative trends and magnitudes. And then for the model tested on Henry Heck Lake, um, microcystin had a value of up to 0.07 nanograms per milliliter which is close to the range reported um, in Hag Lake of 0.15 to 0.43. But again, um, there was not a lot of data available to, to compare to, but it was close to the kind of order of magnitude I was looking for. Uh, and then for cylinders from Opsin, um, had values of up to 0.01 or 0.1 
nanograms per milliliter, which is outside of the range of Florida no detects. Um, but I, which I knew going in, but I wanted to also make sure I was modeling um, a second toxin at the same time. And the relative percentages of both the intracellular and extracellular pools uh, matched um, close, more or less, what I would expect for each of those two toxins. So a little bit more research into toxin biology and chemistry will be a good next step um, to add in model default to the user manual um, for the different uh, constants and rates, as well as to develop sort of equations for those different rates um, and ratios as a function of environmental parameters. So currently, as I mentioned, um, the beta term uh, is a constant value. So it would just be for each toxin, I assume, or from literature, that there's this much toxin per biomass. Um, but there's been a lot of um, studies published on how that might change with different um, maybe limiting nutrients or temperature or light. And so incorporating sort of ranges that those um, that that term can take depending on different environmental parameters will be good to um, include. And then of course, additional testing of the model as it is on water bodies with more toxin data um, to get more um, concrete comparisons. And lastly, um, vertical migration has been recently incorporated into the CQL W2 code as well. And so turning that on and then testing that with the toxins um, will be interesting to see what those results look like. All right, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bernadelle. That was really interesting. Let me set a timer here for questions. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, it's like Chauncey Anderson uh, just typed one in the in the, the chat of the, Chauncey from the USGS. Um, he says, uh, "I missed the model explanation. Do you allow or use the term uh, use a term for N two fixation for AFA?" Yeah, um, I believe we can model nitrogen fixation by setting. Uh, so for the algal groups, I think there's twenty something different parameters and stuff you can um, adjust. And so cyanobacteria would have the same. So you can adjust what your um, nitrogen rates are in there. So yeah, I think you can set it to be nitrogen fixing. Um, say, so Theo, you have a question? Yeah, uh, thanks, Bernadelle. Um, was wondering, uh, one of your model implementations, I think it was the first one, had a, a, a double peak. So you peaked with the I believe it's the extracellular toxin early, maybe it was in spring or something, and then, then again later in the summer. What, what was the cause, and can you detail that for us and, and mention the possible cause? Yeah, it's likely um, the, the cyanobacteria had a secondary bloom. I think I've seen that in some of the um, uh, cyanobacteria graphs. Um, or, or possibly as the um, group ages and then it transition from the intracellular to the extracellular pool um, towards the end of the, the sort of lifespan of that group. But yeah, I haven't looked at that in too much detail. Yeah, so how could you, you could tinker with the settings maybe to try and figure out what's causing it, could you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. yeah, definitely. Yeah. And now when the, our lakes in Oregon, you know, have limited types of cyanobacteria and there may just not be a, a cylindro producer in Hank Lake. Yeah, I believe that's the case. So yeah, Phanazomenon flosequae was the primary, um, like close to 100% of the species detected was that. And I believe I remember reading that it's unlikely that there's, I think, fresh water. Um, yeah, there's just not a lot of that that can produce cylindrical molten, but I don't think it's, it's very common for it to. So yeah, I think that that's very much the case. Thanks. Thank Looks like Rob, you have a question? I, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, that was actually, my question was uh, why we were seeing Cylindrus permopsin from a phanazomenon, but that was um, answered. Thank you. I, um, assuming the model predicts an epilimnetic average uh, toxin concentration, and wondered if you considered trying to evaluate surface scum concentrations, which here in Washington we use to um, guide uh, lake closures, are, are basically our guidelines are based on scum, uh, surface scum out applicate um, concentrations and and uh, wondered if you looked into that at all. <laughs> yeah, not as much with the, the vertical profiles. Um, so the CQL W2 model, you can divide your, um, uh, so 
two dimensional, so it's longitudinal and vertical. So you can divide it into as many vertical layers as you want. Um, but there's not, I know that scum often has higher concentrations than, um, you know, other uh, colonies of the cyanobacteria. Um, but you could, and with the vertical migration turned on, perhaps that would help um, release the toxin at certain levels and you could see maybe a higher concentration of the toxin towards the top. Um, so there certainly is the capability to look at uh, vertical profiles of the toxins. Nice, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we've got time for one more question and it looks like Stuart Dyer typed in the chat. Uh, for total microcystins, the ELISA LOD is around uh, 15 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, would your model change at all if this was uh, included as a constraint? Yeah, I was kind of thinking about that, um, right, because we have, so 0.07 certainly falls below the detection limit, um, so it's not that there wasn't toxin there. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of um, kind of some unknowns. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I think it could be included um, as sort of yeah, a limit, but um, yeah, I'm not sure how we incorporate that. But yeah, it's tough when we have um, the data, right? The data that we have, um, we can't compare that to. It's lower than that. Oh, great. Thanks, Renadel. That was, that was excellent. Um, I think um, if folks have other questions, they might be able to message her directly in the Zoom link. Um, and I think her contact information is also on the website. Um, so we'll move on to uh, the next talk, uh, which is from Tom Warmoth. Is that, am I saying that right, Tom? I'm probably messing that up. But uh, yeah, it's close enough. Yeah, Tom's up next, and um, then we'll um, um, talk about legislation after that. But um, take it away, Tom. Well, I appreciate you all uh, allowing me to present. I know our company is a, a, a sponsor, but I, that's not the reason. I, I hope I have some content here that will uh, benefit the uh, society as far as these uh, use of some of these uh, chemistries, these are peroxygen chemistries and used for cyanobacterial control. Uh, I'm going to go over some data we've had from Clemson University for several years, actually from 2017, 2018. Um, you Tom, know, you're not showing your screen. Oh, no. Oh, wait. Uh, say that, yeah. There it goes. Oh, cool. Thank that you. better? Yep. Yes. All right. Good. Apologies there. Um, so again, my name is Tom Ormuth. I'm with uh, Biosafe Systems, and I uh, I represent the the Lake Pond and Municipal side of our company. We do a lot of work in other other markets for always for treatment, either potable water uh, or even horticulture and, and, and agriculture. But uh, I appreciate Cheryl's time, um, and I will dive into it here. Um, I'm going to be discussing the differences of these chemistries. There are products out available on the market, uh, both uh, liquid as far as PAA, hydrogen peroxide, and, and, and the dry formulation of sodium carbonate peroxyhydrate. Uh, I want to touch on some of the differences between those. Um, let's see here. So uh, these are copper alternative chemistries. I'm, I, I apologize if this seems pitchy. I'm trying to keep this down to a level. I will get into the data here shortly, but I wanted to describe these chemistries as you all may not you know, be looking at, uh, at these chemistries very often. Uh, so I want to be sure that you understand the differences, not just peroxide in general. Um, the granular formulations available on the market um, in many forms uh, essentially do dissociate and create peroxide. Uh, it is, it is uh, a challenge sometimes to, uh, to apply um, due to the, the fact that it is a, a granular formulation and it's quick to react. And, and there's a difference as far as the activity of PAA and peroxyacetic acid or peracetic acid and its ability to be much more effective on true bacteria as far as cyanobacteria are concerned. And that is how the reaction of PAA uh, is much more efficacious than hydrogen peroxide standalone. It's many times stronger and effective at penetrating uh, the membrane of bacteria and not necessarily being the shredding reaction you see with peroxide. Uh, this is more of a penetrating and it's causing cell death in, uh, in bacteria uh, over time. But these chemistries across the markets are usually OMRI listed for organic source waters and also NSF certified for potable water sources. But the biggest thing with these chemistries versus other algicides on the market as far as copper uh, mostly is that they're selective in controlling cyanobacteria versus beneficial phytoplankton and green algae. And that is in the way that they uh, uh, attack these, uh, these uh, targets or non-targets. So uh, usually very quick results, uh, no use restrictions. And one of the other things that's unique uh, to these algicides is that they're able to be reused or applied again every, every other day. 
Um, so this particular chemistry that's available on the market now is only 5% paracetic acid. And again, um, adds a considerable efficacy to the formulation versus peroxide standalone. And there's a wide use range up to uh, you know, 2.3 parts per million of peroxide and five parts per million of PAA. And just to, to lend to the, the safety of this product versus the granular formulation it, 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 is the way the EPA looks at it is that the granular formulation is on an alkaline carrier, uh, soda ash. So that sodium carbonate does attribute some alkalinity when you're going up at its higher rates to try to chase after some of these tougher to control blooms. Whereas this liquid does not have that alkaline. In fact, it's a weak, uh, a weak acid uh, being the base of acetic acid. Um, has a pH of about one, but when you dilute it into water, it doesn't really change the pH of your uh, target water whatsoever. So, but getting down to it, you know, what there, I'm sure most of you understand the difference between algae and cyanobacteria, but you know, algae are eukaryotic. They have a nucleus, they have membrane bound organelles, they have a cell wall. Um, they're, they're a little bit more suited to putting up with uh, a chemistry like a peroxide or PAA, whereas cyanobacteria, you know, prokaryotic, they're a true bacteria. They don't have uh, a nucleus, they don't have membrane bound organelles, and most of their uh, most um, vulnerable points are right there in that membrane, you know, where we can get into that membrane, shut down certain clock genes. Um, in some cases, you're bleaching and lysing in, in the case of very direct applications, but that's not what I want to talk about here. I want to talk about being uh, economical and as well as using the lowest rates possible, as low as a gallon per acre foot to control these, uh, these certain forms of cyanobacteria. But getting back into the selectivity, why is that? I know we're out of October. Um, I like to use this. It usually gets a good laugh um, for Oktoberfest, but um, are using alcohol as a kind of a, a comparison to uh, peroxide, let's say, quote unquote, peroxide. Um, are green algae uh, handling uh, their peroxide better uh, than cyanobacteria? And what is this? Is it a morphologies or is it uh, the fact that uh, many green algae, green algaes have a, uh, a process in their uh, photosynthetic uh, 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 chemical pathways to handle low levels of peroxide? So they can actually break it down with catalase versus cyanobacteria that don't have the cell wall. They don't have their organelles protected by cytoplasm in a cell wall. They don't have catalase. So they cannot handle peroxide or PAA very well. Um, and what we see in the lab, this is going back to 2017 with uh, Dr. Rogers and his, uh, many of these PhD students have moved on to working for Army Corps and other, um, other, uh, other agencies. Uh, still doing uh, ecotoxicology and, 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 and limnology. Um, we see that it, it, the top, that top uh, series was uh, Microcystis aeruginosa with a, about 2 million cells per mil cell density. And over the course of an exposure of 72 hours, we see it takes about 9% of our total label rate, uh, which is about 2.8 gallons per acre foot. You get two ppms of uh, hydrogen peroxide and about a half ppm of PAA. Contrary to that, on the opposite side of the coin, down below we have a similar biomass of scenodesmus, 550 cells per mil. And here it takes upwards of 70% at a much higher rate. You, know, you can see this in the peroxide alone, 15.7 um, you know, milligrams of peroxide versus two to get a control of this, uh, of this desmid green algae. Uh, four ppms of, of, of of parasitic acid along with that. So uh, the green algae, and we see this across the board and there is more research coming. I can't show it. I'm not uh, fully privy to it officially, but it's an, if on a federal level, they're looking at all species in the field in applications to see what's surviving, what, uh, what is not being effective in, in the total enumeration of the, um, of the phytoplankton um, as well as zooplankton. And, uh, and different applications using these chemistries. Um, and there's a lot of eyes on it, but uh, it's about a three year study, about a three quarter million dollar project. Uh, we're one year in doing the um, initial fail, uh, uh, field trials and uh, lab exposure bench, tri bench uh, scale trials. Uh, so hopefully this time next year, I'll have some more to show you. Um, in addition to you control the cyanobacteria in the case, and I know microcystin is, is not considered necessarily an extracellular toxin, but when there is a toxin present, and if we are using an application rate to treat um, reactively a heavy bloom on the surface, um, sometimes our applicators and, and, and municipalities are purposely using a high rate to lyse cells and, and take it out. Um, and when you do have lysis, we have the data showing that 
you do get control of or, or oxi uh, oxidizing of, uh, at least in this case, microcystin LR. And I know there's a, this is just one of 300 different microcystin toxins that are out there. I would assume many of them would oxidize the same and there's some are, are more astringent and difficult to control. But again, this is something we're looking at as far as being able to degrade these toxins, even at low application rates, these are our percentage of, uh, of the label at, um, in the different controls, but this is in the course of minutes um, that we're seeing degradation of the toxin. So um, most typical applications, we try to talk to applicators or if I get on site, you know, we're trying to map out where in the water column these blooms are so we could be targeted in the approach. Many of these Particularly microcystis uh, anabina blooms, or sorry, dolichospermum blooms. Many of them like to get themselves right at the surface of the, of the pond at the highest uh, time of sun and warmth of the day. Um, you can see in that bottom left-hand shot, uh, there's an a, a, a aerator boil that you can see the clear water from below. And here, you know, peeking out my, uh, my Turner design probes, um, I did not do a dilution in this case, but it was peaked out at 199 phycocyanin right at the surface, but just below, we're at 178 ppm of phycocyanin. And you can, we noted that, you know, this looks like around the top less than five feet where we had to target. Um, and we were targeting there at that 2.8 um, gallons per acre foot, uh, which is what we saw from the Clemson research was what was getting us the best control at densities like this. And this was a bloom of doicospermum and uh, microcystis about 50-50. Um, I don't have the cell counts here. Uh, this was some uh, data that was taken during 2020. And I won't say the university involved, but they had some issues with Getting, getting the samples, getting them back to the lab, getting the data on it. But uh, again, a lot of this is just field observations. I'm going to go over four different uh, field observations, learning what we've seen in, the, in our labs and, and, and to applying them in, in the field. So applications are typically done with uh, large John boats to barges, um, bringing the product, uh, applying it in flow with a, with a trash pump or a, a, a centrifugal pump pulling lake water in, pulling the concentrate into that centrifugal pump, mixing it, putting it right out into the, uh, the water either at, at the surface and injected below, targeting that bloom um, wherever it may be, if it's on the surface, however many feet down. And considering of however many feet down, um, city of Santa Cruz, California, they are a lake named Lac Lamont, named after a lake over in uh, Northern Europe. Uh, it's, tip, it's similarly very deep to the locks you see over there. This is a 175 acre um, a reservoir. Uh, it's about 130 feet deep at the, at the dam. And uh, the company there is using a, uh, a GPS enabled system, um, the Clean Lakes, and uh, applying their product with drop hoses uh, throughout the water column. In this case, uh, just recently, this was in 2019, not that recently anymore, um, this is where we started noticing we can get control of these, uh, in, in this case, it was uh, microcystis aeruginosa uh, and dolichospermum. Um, treated at depths up to 20 feet and treating, uh, if you see on the right-hand side, the last, second to last column, we're treating at a rate of about one gallon an acre foot, which up until this point, I was really uh, apprehensive at uh, getting, seeing if we would have control at these low rates. But in this case, this water is fairly clear. Uh, they get second disc readings. Usually they're upset if it's not anything, um, if it's nothing less than 10 feet. So they get second disc readings, 10, 15, 20 feet. Uh, so there's not a lot of other competition for the product to be oxidizing anything, effectively or not. Um, so they're seeing control as that PAA peroxide eventually bumps into something. So uh, they do allow for copper applications there, but they're limited. I'll talk briefly about that in a minute, but um, typically they'll do a copper application in the early part of the season uh, when water temperatures warm up. And here you can see secchi disc uh, readings eventually uh, improving, but dramatically improving post-treatment uh, with our green clean there, second application that Green Star, uh, in this case, it was in October. Similarly, looking at uh, cell counts here, they're treating very early on, you know, 250, uh, sorry, uh, 2,500 cells per mil. And uh, uh, the treating at that copper application. And then later on, you know, they're treating before it even gets to 1,000 cells per mil. Um, typically, they're seeing these uh, blooms. They don't generally get better until, unless they do some sort of a preemptive action um, when, they, when they're seeing the blooms take it off. But again, they do have a copper limit. So they're usually limited to one copper application per year. Uh, their copper limit's at 13 micrograms per liter. Um, and you can even see at the beginning of the, of the, of the, uh, of the chart there in late December, uh, that's still a residual before they get their ice milk coming through. 
and essentially diluting their, uh, it's, this is all copper. This isn't, this is not necessarily all bioavailable copper, but all copper that's being tested for. And at that time when they do their treatment, it slowly starts ticking up and they're just sampling at their fish release there. So if they were to do another treatment, it'd likely tick up uh, more. And that's why they use the product here in this case. So there was a recent application mm, about two months ago. Um, they saw that same trans, uh, transition of, the, of, of cell counts going up, chlorophyllae going up. Again, uh, microcystis and dolichospermum are primary culprits here. And they're, they're targeting them for taste and odor, uh, even at low rates. And they, again, don't want anything in their water there. They're lucky they have very clean water. Um, the sampling was taken right before the treatment, and it does look like the that the treatment was done as the as the the, the numbers were crashing. But if there was, there was a sample taken the day of, it would likely be still uh, at, above the star there. But the uh, what we do want to note here is that we don't see at these low rates we don't see immediate cell lysis. Um, we don't see this immediate crash in um, in phycocyanin or chlorophyll. Um, what we do see is the cyanobacteria essentially being controlled and, and progressive cell death throughout several days. You have cell death and they lose their buoyancy and over the course of three to five days, falling out of the, uh, out of the water column and then degrading usually in the, uh, the benthic sediments, the, the lower benthos of the, of the lake um, as they would if they were cycling, growing, dying off and dropping out of the water column. So there still would be a release of toxin as they're degrading, but it would be down in the sediments and where bacterial degradation would likely uh, handle it over the course of time. Again, this is their the surface blooms are quite intense, but just below the surface, it's quite clear um, pre and post observations there from Santa Cruz. Uh, secondly, this is going back to 2017, another application with Clean Lakes in uh, San Antonio Reservoir, um, one of the San Francisco public utilities applications here, quite a large app, uh, uh, reservoir, uh, 800 surface acres, requiring them to put out the product quite quickly with four boats, um, it's copper restricted reservoir. Uh, quite a bit of product. Again, treating at that uh, target rate of 2.8 gallons per acre foot um, because of the intensity of the bloom here. Um, a lot of data here, but 80, over 80% 80 of, the, of, of the total enumeration was in the top five feet of the water column. And most of that, again, this is a few years ago, they're still calling it antibiotics, this is dolichospermum, uh, about uh, 2,500 cells per mil or 2.5 million cells per cubic meter. Uh, and you can see the phycocyanin reference units around 7,000, quite high. And here, geosmin is the target. They're trying to control the geosmin in the water column. Uh, peaked at over 100 parts per trillion pre-treatment, post-treatment. Um, you can see the reference units dropped considerably uh, down, and the uh, cell counts down to 13,000, or in this case, 13 uh, cells per mil. So if you see that in this bar graph, it's quite dramatic, but what we do to notice is uh, ahead of the treatment, uh, dominated by uh, anabena in this case, um, if you notice post-treatment, almost everything in the, in, the, in the upper water column is, uh, drops out, but you do notice that uh, zooplankton, the gray portion of the bar is not, uh, green algae and diatoms generally are not, and then post-treatment, you do see a diet, slight diatom increase, and I wanna call it a bloom necessarily, uh, which tapers off and, and to note, um, Jasmine levels did drop to under non-detect then 10 days after the treatment. Um, and, and we did also see that the uh, cyanobacteria in the enumeration, um, it's not noted here as what they were, but uh, they were of non-concern. Uh, and the anabana that was in the top five heat was controlled, um, decreased by uh, total plankton concentrations by 93%. Um, and then anabana dropped by about 99%. Uh, Quincy Reservoir, City of Aurora, Colorado, this is 2019. Uh, similar application from the surface, treating the top meter or so, uh, loading from the shoreline. Uh, Pre-treatment sample, these are uh, toxin samples that were taken at their water quality lab. Um, microsystem toxin around 40 parts per billion, uh, taken uh, out in the middle of the lake. It was treated on August 30th, uh, top seven feet, again, 2.8 gallons per acre foot. Um, noted in the parentheses, 24 hours after treatment, that uh, toxin levels total microcystin toxin was measured at uh, four parts per billion 24 hours after treatment, and then five days after treatment, non detect on September 3rd. Um, again, notable too, uh, some of these coves that were loaded with uh, scums and heavy buildups were treated uh, with a tank mix, a quite a strong tank mix to knock back some of these scums. This is also a recreational water body, so they had it closed down around Labor Day. Uh, no one could even walk around the lake. 
Um, and it was only permissible to have kayaks and other uh, non -elect just electric motorized boats, but that was also closed down for several weeks. Um, but they saw in these treatment areas that the green algae came back within about a week that was probably in low, low numbers there and being uh, essentially outcompeted by the cyanobacteria. But if we had control over that green algae using these rates that we were using, you wouldn't see them here. And here they seem to be coming back uh, quite well. And this was a benefit because a lot of wading birds being able to go through this, you know, uh, uh, foraging and things. And this was a, a mixture of uh, spirogyra and, and hydrodictium. Um, again, these are beneficial algae in these systems and uh, not controlled by the, uh, by the product. Harbor Isle, this is our last one. Um, this is uh, a limited amount of, of information here, but it is well monitored from the Florida DEP and their uh, harmful algal bloom dashboard. Um, so that's the site there near St. Petersburg, right on the Tom, Gulf. Tom, we got two minutes left. So we um, to a lot of our questions, we'll need to wrap up here pretty quick. This is almost it. All right. 26 acre lake, uh, relatively deep, um, dominated by microcystis genosa, experiencing you know, annual turnover blooms and that just seem to stay throughout the season. Um, there was a nanobubble system implemented here uh, for six months. Um, they were not seeing the benefits of it. Uh, and then they decided that they wanted to do something uh, a little sooner and a little more stringent to get control. Uh, so they decided to go with the uh, dosing of the uh, PAA peroxide. Again, uh, using a little higher rate here, considering the conditions on the lake, um, about five gallons an acre foot for the top meter or so. So what we did notice though, uh, turbidity was clarified extremely. I have it highlighted, um, 48.3 dropped down to 1.74, um, six days after treatment. Uh, it is noted that this was one month before treatment was the, when the water quality data was originally collected, um, before treatment and then post-treatment six days after. Um, and that, I, also notable that with the competition with all the cyanobacteria in the system for the nanobubbles, you have really high ammonia levels that were dropped immediately after this application with the control of the cyanobacteria, the nanobubbles were actually able to oxidize the high ammonia levels. This is a nasty lake, I have to say, I've been there. Um, and here's the, the dramatic results, I guess you would say, but uh, surface dominated by microcyst aeruginosa, the microcystin concentrations um, sampled on February 19th, the application was done on uh, March 10th, um, but the conditions were noted as not improving by the lake management company and those others from the DEP. They did not do follow-up sampling um, the day of the treatment. But again, um, six days after treatment, microcystin levels non-detect. Um, and to show you too as well, I think the, the system, if it was doing something, was keeping the, 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 the lake in check post-treatment. So we had uh, pre-treatment pictures, post-treatment at 48 hours later, and then uh, 40 days post-treatment um, still have clarity and the clarity persisted into May and June. So just to thank you guys, uh, Oregon Lakes, Clemson, Queen Lakes, Solitude, City of San Francisco, uh, Public Utilities, Santa Cruz and Florida DEP. Um, I'm sorry if I used up too much of my time. Oh, uh, no, that's fine. I was, I was just keeping track of it. I want to make sure we had some time, some time for questions. I think we have um, time for maybe one question. Um, anyone has any? Uh, I might have one if, if, um, if folks don't have any. Uh, Theo, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, you, there was one slide, it was the um, San Antonio uh, one, where you did have a, after the, immediate, yeah, after, immediately after that blue line, you, everything dropped. Right. Now, the others, this, everything apart from the cyanos bounced back, but uh, why, why was there such a big drop initially, do you think? Not really sure, other than uh, potentially clarifying of the water uh, could have more light attenuation and things were not uh, up in that upper strata with the with more light attenuation, I really don't know. Typically we don't see control of the greens or diatoms at these rates. We have to use our maximum label rates to get control of most diatoms and, and green algae. And with other competition in the water for these oxidizers, if it's not, in C2 uh, bench scale trial, you do see some things like this, but in, in, the, in the real world, we just generally don't see, definitely don't see fish kills. Uh, most of the, uh, we've seen no, no EC effects on fathead minnows needing, you know, requiring up to 10 gallons an acre foot. And that is in, you know, mesocosm exposures. That's, uh, you know, uh, no EC on PAA on fathead minnow, which is probably one of the most sensitive is about 1.9 parts per million of PAA. 
And that would require about a continued dose of about 10, 10 gallons per acre foot. And that's, that's usually well outside of our application range. And when you have untreated water outside of our zone, again, we're trying to usually target the top meter or a, a bloom. We're not trying to do full lake uh, exposure uh, at these rates. Um, hey, yeah, thanks. And for the first uh, thing you described, that, that was there were treatments in 2019. They had copper in the middle. I suppose it was Santa Cruz, copper in the middle of the year. And then your treatment in October. Yep, and, this was. Uh, yeah. Actually, so was, what what happened in 2020? Did they are they still doing the copper in the middle of the year, or would they do the peroxide? I don't think they had any applications in. They may have only did one application. It may have just been copper in 2020. Um, to my knowledge, they didn't do any applications with the with peroxides. Then they can use copper, and I think they if they need to do additional treatments is when they pull out uh, the green clean, just because of again that limitation on their copper. Is the copper cheaper than the peroxide then? Um, it can be. In the, if you're using copper sulfate, it can be, yeah. Some of the lower rates of copper sulfate and chelate. The chelates, they, they can actually equate to about the same, uh, same cost. Um, mm -hmm. but, but effectiveness and ease of application is generally a little easier with copper because it can persist in the water column so much longer. It gets a little more mixing, mm -hmm. um, whereas the, the peroxide need, does need to be dosed uh, effectively um, at depth using, using boats. It's not a put it in one point and hope that it gets over to point A, from point A to point B, because it's going to degrade pretty quickly. You know, usually it's only available in the water column that day. Yeah. Good. You mentioned zooplankton briefly, because I have seen from the Dutch data that, uh, that at the rates at which you, um, that are pretty low, as you're saying, where it's effective against the cyanos and doesn't harm mostly the, the other phytoplankton, that's also true of the zoos. And yes. so that's good. So it doesn't mess up the ecology in too bad a way. Yes. Great. Well, thanks, Tom. That was that was really interesting. I always like seeing different approaches to to um, deal with halves. Um, and, and, you know, oh yeah, I definitely or... want to highlight that this is not a silver bullet. It's you know along with you know nutrient mediation and and, and, and controlling nutrient coming in and other app, other forms of control measures and, and monitoring are required to get you know, you know effective treatments on these things. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, excellent. Well, thanks. And, and as before, um, if you have other questions for Tom, uh, please, uh, you can message, message him directly through Zoom. Uh, or again, the contact information is on our, uh, on our website. Um, so with that, um, we do um, have a little bit of space in the, the schedule. Our, our talk, was unexpected, uh, talk was unexpectedly canceled um, earlier this week uh, due to, just uh, to a travel issue that couldn't be resolved. Um, so we thought during this time, um, we could take Theo, myself, and maybe if I could draft Aaron Borisenko, who I see is on the on the um, um, conference, to talk briefly about some recent updates to funding positions and kind of outlook for for funding uh, and and legislation on, on HABs within Oregon. And maybe Theo, I'll hand it off to you to, to begin, and I can chime in as needed, and maybe we can have Aaron chime in too. Okay, thanks, Dan. Yeah, I just like to say that, um, uh, of course, there's been a lot of activity in through the legislature. Uh, from some key legislators, particularly Ken Helm. Um, and I think a lot of it was kicked off by the, the, the panic and frantic uh, response to the, um, the Salem water crisis in, in summer of 2018. But I would say that through our uh, cyanobacterial stakeholder meetings that we've been having annually for, for quite a few years, um, after taking them over from, from OHA, um, it was at one of those meetings that we decided to, to really put some effort into um, it, trying to influ influence and educate the, the legislators. And Ken Helm came to our last joint meeting with Walper, the, the, the Washington Society that we held, I think it was in 2000, must have been 2018, late 2018. And I do think that that really helped to, um, to move things along. So I think OLA is, um, I'm sort of really pleased that we've been able to, to have a bit of an influence, and I think we can do that in the future in 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 other topics. So um, I do welcome uh, that sort of input uh, input in in that sort of direction from the membership. If um, uh, if if you have an interest in 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 pushing an issue concerned with lakes, but with regard to the sign of bacteria, of course, in, in over the long haul looking backwards, OHA, the Oregon Health Authority, had some very good capacity, especially in the period when they were funded with a CDC grant. But after that ran out, 
uh, probably the mid, uh, probably around 2015 or so, uh, they just didn't have much capacity. And there had not been very much in expertise and interest and capacity, I think was the issue in DEQ. And so since the, the emergency from Salem, that kicked up some, some money that went to DEQ and Aaron Borisenko's group to uh, analyze for cyanotoxins. And since that time now, we've seen, fortunately, a fair bit of money go, or, or significant money go to DEQ. And now we have uh, fantastic scientific capabilities in DEQ and, and Dan's uh, work is particularly with cyanobacteria. Uh, so it's it's wonderful to see we have capacity there for cyanotoxin analyses very quickly to help with uh, the, the to detect the presence of uh, cyanotoxins in drinking water across the state, um, and and working hand in hand with OHA to regulate and um, and post blooms that that do turn out to be toxic, we we I think again have established a really good system. Um, and so I really commend DEQ for, for stepping up to it and, and um, uh, now having built up a, a really good amount of, of expertise in, in uh, cyanotoxins and cyanobacteria. So yeah, Dan, you had the rundown on the funding that came through this, this year from the 2021 legislature. Yeah, I might pass that to Aaron to discuss in a little bit more detail because he's more familiar with the laboratory piece of the funding. Sure thing. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or maybe don't know me, I'm Aaron Borisenko. I manage the water quality monitoring section here at the DEQ laboratory. Um, yeah, I want to uh, first thank the work groups that formed. There, were, there was a group of, uh, of stakeholder work groups that formed around the issue of harmful algae bloom needs for the state of Oregon. And one of those work groups uh, was around monitoring and prediction uh, needs for uh, monitoring harmful algae blooms around the state. There were other ones that were worked, worked on emergency response needs, communication needs, and things like that. Uh, and they were pretty broad-based groups um, and, you know, NGOs, uh, stakeholder groups of different types that just had some interest in this particular issue. And it was really out of those, the recommendations that came out of the monitoring and prediction work group that uh, were passed along to um, the legislature. And, and as Theo mentioned, Representative Helms in, in charge of the water committee, that those resources were, were provided to us to expand some of our current capabilities to do monitoring around harmful algae bloom issues in Oregon. Our initial capabilities, as Theo mentioned, developed out of um, the emergency that happened in Salem in 2018 and that required the Oregon Health Authority to rapidly develop an emergency rule for how we were going to protect public water systems that are potentially vulnerable to upstream HABs development that could be influencing cyanotoxins coming into their source water. And so out of that particular uh, initial effort, we got a, an ELISA instrument, a cyanotoxin autoanalyzer system uh, a, a chemist to analyst here at our laboratory and a person to help coordinate with public water facilities the monitoring um, on a every other week basis in the in the peak summer months from May through October as dictated by that Oregon rule um, to do the analysis for that and if you know and, and basically look for concentrations that exceeded the health advisory level but there was there were still gaps and we all knew that there were gaps um, in the monitoring needs for Oregon. And, and those gaps are become apparent when you start looking at the recreational side of HABs. There are a lot of water bodies that get HABs during the summer months that have either, you know, public health risks associated with them around, uh, you know, recreational swimming and other needs. And they just go unmonitored in many cases. And the Oregon Health Authority does a very good job with the very limited staff they have of of triaging those scenarios, working with us at DEQ, but also working with a variety of partners to try to understand the extent of the HABs, the severity of it, and what the public health risks are uh, before you know, asking either us or someone else to do monitoring on that particular water body. So the resources we got in this, this last legislative session were uh, and it, the addition of another auto analyzer instrument 
uh, and two new positions, a, uh, another analyst to help with um, doing cyanotoxin analysis on water bodies, and then a field staff person to help us collect data on water bodies that are going unmonitored. Uh, they are now in place. Uh, after getting that funding, there's you know some work to do and getting the, those positions recruited and people trained and things like that. They're now in, pl in place. And we're working to be strategic about how to implement those resources as we move into the 2022 calendar year. You know, it's important to rec recognize that we have one field staff person and we have one new analyst on top of the, the already very committed resources to do the drinking water work. So um, I, I, we're very appreciative of those resources. We will be able to do more with those resources than, than we have in the past, but we also need to be aware that we can't do everything. And so we'll be working uh, with our partners, with our, within internally at DEQ, with Oregon Health Authority and other to come up with a rational plan for how best to implement the those resources in this upcoming biennium. And we anticipate that that implementation is not going to be perfect, that it'll be a, you know, an iterative process in understanding what's working well and what isn't and how to better implement the program as we progress. So it'll also, there'll also be some learning along the way, but we're gonna be very transparent about what it is we're doing and how we're trying to help uh, uh, monitoring cyanotoxins across Oregon. So um, any questions about that? Aaron, Aaron you, you mentioned uh, auto-analyzer. Now you have the cyanotoxin, maybe that's an auto-analyzer too, and the nutrient. Uh, analyzers. So you, you have two of the cyanotoxin analyzers, which are used to detect principally for drinking water and occasionally recreational. But what, what are your plans for the um, uh, nutrient analyzer? Very good question. Thank you for that. Um, and I apologize for that omission. We also did get a nutrient analyzer. Nutrients are obviously an important part of understanding what could be driving these HABs. So our, we have done some initial uh, data collection at some, of the, uh, at some of the fire areas from 2020, um, not using that instrument, but in response to those fires, just to understand uh, at some of our ambient locations and by adding some new sites through the Toxics Monitoring Program to understand what might be going on below those fires to understand some of the drivers behind HABs and, uh, and try to get better information. Also, Dan's been doing a lot of work in the Cascade High Lakes around um, cyanotoxin uh, in situ measurements and doing uh, nutrient data collection. So I anticipate that we'll be incorporating nutrients as part of this plan for the next biennium to, to try to get a better handle on what might be driving some of these blooms in certain areas. Chauncey, you have a, your hand raised? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so this is sort of a provocative or rhetorical question, maybe, but um, I sometimes think of that there's a really significant, important objective difference between public health monitoring and trying to understand a system and how it's going to respond to nutrients and how to control HABs and things like that. So I'm guessing that in this particular case, you're going to be primarily focused on public health at the kind of because of legislative um, attention, but just wanted to hear your thought on that. I, I very much appreciate that, that comment. And there is that tension uh, between missions. Um, and, you know, I think our goal here, Chauncey, is uh, we do need to be, right, in my, at least in my estimation, responsive to what the work group considerations were. And that is around public health concerns, around recreational waters. But to the extent that um, we can gather additional information on those water bodies to help understand what's, what watershed processes are driving those HABs or maybe making them worse, those types of things, and feed into watershed management planning activities, I think we'd also like to do some of that too. And so, you know, we are going to be doing some strategic planning here in fall and winter at DEQ and, and working with our colleagues at OHA to, to plan out how we want to best implement those very limited resources. I want to, I want to emphasize that uh, moving forward. And, 
and learn from our, our plan and, and, and adapt our plan as we move forward, as we learn uh, better ways of doing business. You know, I think some of the work that Dan, Dan and Yuan have done on the Cyan application data, you know, bringing that into the equation. Um, the work groups also recommended some type of a tiering system for water bodies, uh, looking at um, public health concerns on different water bodies, maybe type A, type B, type C water bodies, depending on the risk associated with those, uh, and, what, and trying to define a little more clearly what that could look like would also help us with some monitoring plans for, for some of these locations. So there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, you know, we're gonna dig in and do what we can, but we'll also be asking for patience in our in implementation as we get this up and running. Understood. Well, I guess I'd just urge you to keep that kind of objective question in mind as you guys go through that about public health versus versus sort of management related um, or watershed processes and things like that. That's, it, that. that's very much in our mind and we're kind of laying the groundwork to move towards that, that management side um, for understanding what, you know, what factors are continuing to have across the state. Um, we, have, we did ask also during the last session for an analyst position within um, the watershed management section to actually do analysis of water quality data, um, but that was not recommended, although we're going to ask for that again, I think in the short session, and if not then, uh, the next session as well. So hopefully we're building some capacity to better tackle the, um, um, the issue surrounding, uh, you know, basically watershed management of HABs. How do we reduce incidents and, and manage them effectively? I might say in a, in a broader context in, in Oregon, this last, last legislature um, um, benefited by funds coming from the feds and from a, from a strong Oregon economy and had a lot of money and, and dedicated 0.5 of, of a billion dollars to water related uh, uh, expenditures. Now, a fair bit of it is, is sort of infrastructure pipes and, and improving uh, treatment, water treatment facilities and stuff. But there's a lot of interest uh, in 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 water, um, uh, critical supply of, of drinking water, but also water in the environment, and um, and so I, I I think it is a good time, and and it's perhaps a time for people to remind legislators of that if you're active at all in that that that, that direction, and and uh, you know keep keep the focus on. Um, as Chauncey was saying, not not just public health uh, panic responses, but also the the overall health of of ecosystems, because then you hopefully wouldn't have to have a panic response. Agreed. Yeah. Well, thanks, Theo. Thanks, Aaron, for the the overview. Um, and, um, so I think an effective use of the the time. Um, so I think we're going to transition to the next top. Uh, Chitty Kislik is uh, from UC Berkeley is up next, and she's going to be talking about using Sentinel-2 satellite imagery um, to detect uh, algal blooms in a small reservoir in Northern California. Um, and to be just just to be aware, if you have your chat box open, I'll be sending periodic updates about the time left, just as a, as okay, a warning. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. <clears throat> All right. Let me share my screen. Let's see if. Okay, can people see my screen now? Yep, I can see it. Perfect, all right. Sorry, I lost my voice this weekend, but it's really great to see all of you on Zoom. Thank you so much to all the previous presenters. My name is Chippy Kislik, and I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. And today I'm gonna talk about how we can use satellite imagery, mainly Sentinel-2, 10 meter resolution imagery, and Google Earth Engine to detect algal blooms in two small reservoirs, of the Klamath River, which are technically in California, but very close to Oregon. Throughout this talk, I'll be describing harmful algal blooms and cyanobacteria, showing you where this study took place, explaining why the study is important and how we achieved our objectives and how our findings can be implemented into management practices. So as most of you know, algae can be very, very important features of an aquatic ecosystem, However, big proliferations and excess toxins can cause public health events that are very serious. And so this is a photo from September 2020 of Iron Gate Reservoir. So microcystin toxins, liver damage. Um, this is a big risk in two of the reservoirs that I'm going to talk about today. And 
let's move on to Iron Gate Reservoir specifically. So this is Iron Gate Dam, as you can see, and the motivation for this project stems from understanding the spatial and temporal aspects of algal blooms in small reservoirs, such as this one here. And these small reservoirs are really important for aquatic species, downstream water quality, salmon spawning, um, if they can reach these reservoirs, cultural activities, and a lot of other lakes and reservoirs around the world use these reservoirs for drinking water, irrigation, and recreation. So really important that we understand them. And as we know, the four dams that are going to be removed in this system, including this dam here that you see, we really wanna know what's the baseline information that we can look at so that we can try and expect how blooms might change when the dams are removed and how we can monitor this. This project is really interesting because we know that algal blooms are dynamic in both space and time. However, we need a little bit more testing of the tools that we have at our fingertips for how we can capture this heterogeneity. So a lot of other researchers have been able to detect blooms in large bodies of water using satellite missions such as Sentinel-3 at 300 meter resolution. And sometimes this spatial scale is too large for some of the smaller reservoirs throughout California, Oregon, throughout the US. Also, current in-situ sampling intervals of maybe once or twice a month sometimes don't capture that temporal aspect of blooms that can appear for days or even hours. So we're here to find out how we can use higher resolution satellite imagery, such as 10 meter spatial resolution, Sentinel-2 imagery, that comes at about five to 10 day temporal resolution to identify algal blooms in two small reservoirs of the Klamath River. So here is my study area. We're in the Klamath River in Kopka Reservoir on the right and Iron Gate Reservoir on the left, as you can see in this map. And we're interested in this site because we want to know how the dams will change the algal blooms um, when they are actually removed in about two or three years. And the three tiny red dots that you may or may not be able to see within the map are in situ sampling locations that Pacificor, the company that operates the dams, uses to conduct monthly water quality measurements. So these three dots are also my study sites. So I named them Copco, Below Copco, and Iron Gate. And I just created a 15 meter buffer or circle around each of these points to extract satellite imagery from these circles and then compare them to the in-situ water quality data. We use Sentinel-2 multispectral instrument data at the level 1C, and that's top of atmosphere level, which means that we needed to perform atmosphere correction to remove aerosols and water vapor from the imagery. We also incorporated in-situ chlorophyll A data, which is a proxy for algal biomass, and microcystin, the cyanobacteria toxin data, and that was collected monthly by Pacificor from March through December through each year of this time series. And this study specifically is from October 2015 through December 2019, since Sentinel-2 imagery only starts in 2015. And this is just a preliminary analysis, and I'll be adding 2020 data to this time series very soon. After we obtained that monthly in-situ data, we created a Sentinel-2 Level 1C collection in Google Earth Engine. So everything you see in the purple, that's Google Earth Engine. And then we applied a cloud mask to all the images and performed atmosphere correction to convert. BOA just stands for bottom of atmosphere. So we wanted to get rid of the clouds and aerosols and water vapor. And then we applied four different spectral indices and we wanted to figure out which one best predicts chlorophyll A in the system. And then we calculated standardized anomalies or deviations from the mean. And then in R, all of the rectangles that you can see in green, we organized the data into four different categories for interpretation, regressed the spectral index values on the in-situ water quality data, and then performed root mean squared error to assess the accuracy.
Most of the analysis was performed in Google Earth Engine, which is super fun. And this is a really powerful tool that's free for anybody to use, and it includes a ton of data sets. And the best part is that I didn't have to download any of the satellite imagery, and that can often consume a lot of hard drive space. Um, and I was able to produce charts, like you see on the right side, to plot out the satellite spectral index values. And here are those four spectral indices that we compared in the study. So you can see them on the left. So there's the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, which is pretty common and used in terrestrial studies to look at greenness of vegetation. And this includes the near-infrared, which is on that far right side of that colorful electromagnetic spectrum diagram at the bottom, and the red. So you can see that maybe 700 nanometers on the right side as well. And then we also use the Normalized Difference Chlorophyll Index, which uses the red edge band, that's right in between red and near-infrared, and the red band. And this is used in a lot of algal bloom studies and it's been proven to be very successful. And then we also wanted to test a slightly narrower near-infrared band. So that, that's why we use that B4, B8A index. And then finally, we wanted something completely different. So we tried blue and green bands, since we're looking at blue-green algae and there's often high reflectance peaks in those two colors. So that's why we tested this fourth index, which is B3, B2. And before we get to the results, we wanted to just show you how dynamic these algal blooms are. So this is a snapshot of the four different spectral indices at one of the sampling locations. So that's COPCO from October 2015 through December 2020. And the blue vertical lines are the in situ water quality sampling days, which occur about once a month. However, since there are a lot of clouds in some of the imagery, especially during winter months or somewhere around spring, there often aren't images that are available right around that in situ sampling day. And I only included, you know, plus or minus five days from the in situ sampling day, which is also pretty generous. So there were some gaps in this time series, but if we can establish a good relationship between satellite imagery and in situ imagery, in situ data, then we can have a really, really nice continuous time series as we see here, which could really help us capture how dynamic these blooms are in time. Here are the standardized anomalies or deviations from the average NDVI values and NDCI values on the right side. So these are for 2016 through 2019 and only from July through November because I only wanted to look at the kind of cyanobacteria um, time period in the system. And just as the last slide showed how the algal blooms in these two reservoirs are dynamic in space, these anomalies demonstrate that these events are dynamic in time. So you can see that Kopko Reservoir, the reservoir on the right in every pairing, experiences higher blooms on average than Iron Gate, which is on the left, particularly in 2017 and 2019, which were wetter years. 2018 generally was a less than average bloom year, except in Iron Gate at the most downstream point, and 2016 is more average than the rest. And this figure can be really useful for managers who want to understand where the blooms are occurring to potentially implement localized treatments or sampling protocols. But having that established relationship between the satellite imagery and the in-situ data would potentially replace the need for additional sampling, which we know can be very time consuming and expensive. These scatter plots show the high variability of algal blooms at these three sites. So at COPCO, below COPCO and Iron Gate from October, 2015. And this goes all the way through 2020. In general, COPCO had the highest spectral index values, had really big spikes, especially in August 2019. And you can see the spectral index values have similar patterns, but sometimes very different values. And this depends on the spectral bands that were used. And after plotting these data in Google Earth Engine, we then regressed the in situ data on the spectral indices to evaluate which index performed the best at these three sites so that we could expand our analysis in space and time. Here we examined the relationship between the four spectral indices that we were looking at and the in-situ chlorophyll A data. 
So these are just R squared values, and we're looking at a chlorophyll A relationship. And these are derived from a cubic polynomial regression equation between these two. So you can see higher R squared in green and lower R squared values in red. And we then categorize all these values into four groups for each of the three study sites. So we have the overall time series from October 2015 to December 2019, the wet years, which are 2017 and 2019, the dry years, 2016 and 2018, and the cyanobacteria season, which is July through November of each year. And we can see that the normalized difference chlorophyll index, or NDCI, was the best at all sites, while that blue-green B3, B2 was the worst. And then wet years seemed to perform the best, and dry years seemed to perform the worst for, this, um, for the spectral indices. So this study helps expand the spatial and temporal lens of algal blooms for aquatic managers in this system. And the standardized anomalies were able to show specific locations for localized treatments and removal, while the charts that we produce in Google Earth Engine showed when managers can implement protocols, such as iron gate curtain, for example, which is something that you see here, which can help trap algae as it moves downstream. And also, results from this study provide pre-dam removal baseline data, which may be able to demonstrate how future dam removal can affect algal blooms. And it's possible that this could incentivize other dam removals in similar environments across the world. Still to be seen. So there were some limitations in the study, mainly the mismatch between satellite flyovers and the monthly in-situ sampling. And we ran into cloud issues, as you can see in the image here. And not all satellite flyovers were within five days of the in-situ sampling period, so it left some holes in our time series. Also, chlorophyll A does not indicate cyanobacteria, so we're only detecting really general algal blooms. We're not looking at the type or any toxins. And we still need in situ data collection for that. And finally, Sentinel-2 satellite imagery is only atmospherically corrected starting in 2019 for imagery across the globe. So we had to employ this atmospheric correction package to our Google Earth Engine imagery collection. There are a lot of different ways to do that, so you might get different results. Just things to be aware of. Future work involves using planet three meter resolution imagery to look at algal blooms in even smaller reservoirs, maybe across California or across Oregon. And we wanted to use the best spectral indices from this study and apply them to the next studies. So that includes NDVI and NDCI. And here you can see Sentinel-2 and planet scope images for August 1st, 2019. They look relatively similar just upon first glance, which is really promising despite they have slight differences in wavelengths in the red and near infrared bands. So we look forward to diving into this more. In conclusion, the study demonstrates that spectral indices that use the red edge and near infrared bands, such as NDCI, that chlorophyll index, are great for these types of waters, especially turbid and less clear waters. While blue and green bands, like that B3, B2 index, might be better for clearer waters. Wetter years have the best results for this analysis, and tools like Google Earth Engine can provide the spatial and temporal resolution to detect high variability of algal blooms in these small reservoirs that monthly in situ sampling can't always do. And also, we hope that these findings are useful in future dam removal incentives and planning efforts. And so our story ends here at Iron Gate Reservoir on a nice and sunny day. And I'm happy to share any Google Earth Engine code or R code once this project wraps up in the next month or two. So feel free to reach out. Here's my email. Um, would love to get in contact. Thanks so much. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Chevy. That was great. Um, we have a question. I think, Eli, you're, you're first. Yeah, hi, Chippy. I was hey. uh, just wondering if you played around with um, different uh, buffer diameters for your for your oh, point. Yeah. Uh, yes. It seems like it makes a lot of sense to use a really small one if the temporal, if the, if the you know, if you're getting exactly the same time, but if you're using something from like five days away, I mean, the wind <laughs> kind of blows the algae back and forth across the reservoir. I wonder if it, if you played around with using, you know, a bigger buffer. Yeah. Especially for, for date or imagery that was further away from the sample. 
Yeah, this is, thanks so much for that. So for anyone who doesn't do remote sensing, the buffer is just that circle um, around that in-situ point. But that's a great question. And I was exploring a lot with actually placement of these buffers because a lot of the sampling occurs off a bridge or off of the Iron Gate curtain. So there was actually, um, it was interfering with the reflectance values. So I was moving them around, like slightly upstream a little bit, but um, that's a good idea. I haven't actually expanded the, the buffer size itself. I've tried to expand it across the reservoirs themselves that went like taking the best regression and then applying that equation and then mapping out mapping that out like in these um, images right here. But I like that idea. I think I will maybe just explore with some of the four and five day and maybe make those buffers a bit bigger to, to incorporate the movement of algae. I love that. Thanks so much. Great. Great. Amalia, um, oh yeah. I think you're up next. Hi, Chippy. Thanks for this great talk. Um, I wonder if, um, and it's possible that I may have missed this, but uh, did you look at sort of the difference in the relationship between the um, these uh, spectral indices and how they related to the in-situ chlorophyll and microsystem data? And if there were any differences in that relationship, does that give you any insight into how well these um, spectral indices are representing uh, algal blooms more broadly versus uh, cyanobacteria and specifically cyanotoxin production? Yeah, that's a great question. I noticed that um, above a certain um, like uh, chlorophyll A level, some of the indices didn't perform that well. So there was kind of a nice happy medium in which they performed the best. Um, but these can only really look at kind of algal biomass if you wanted to look more at cyanobacteria, then Sentinel-3 is really good for that because they have like a phycocyanin index and different bands used for that. Um, but this is still, yeah, kind of just a general look at algal biomass. Um, and these are just pretty, pretty simple like equations, just normalized equations. Um, but yeah, there, there definitely are specific ranges in which these indices tend to work for the chlorophyll A detection. Thanks. Uh, Aaron, I think you're up next. Hi, Chippy. I really enjoyed your talk. It was very interesting. And I'm uh, jealous of that 10 meter resolution, especially looking at the 3A 300 meter resolution. Has anybody worked to to look at the 2A and 3A data together to, to sort of develop relationships between Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 and understand that a little better? Yeah, I've seen a little bit of this work happen. I've seen um, some some general comparisons of this work um, a little bit. And then I've also heard of Sentinel Planet Landsat, um, like a harmonized product that's being created right now. So something like that is kind of interesting to increase or decrease resolution. But um, yeah, that's kind of the goal of this project is to be able to scale up and look at cyanobacteria with smaller, with higher resolution imagery. Thank you. Great. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Stuart Dyer. Um, can you apply uh, topobathometric, topobathometric uh, LIDAR data that's been collected for this area to see if the Sentinel data is being biased by water depth within the reservoirs? Mm. Ooh, that's a really cool idea. So yeah, applying, applying LIDAR data to see if it's biased with water depth. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a way to do that. I've never thought about that, but I, I do like that idea because we could see that there was a big difference between the wet and dry years. And so I would really like to know kind of how much um, like water column and water clarity are impacting these indices. But I'll have to think a little bit more on that and how to actually incorporate LIDAR. Great, thanks. Uh, Theo, I think we're out of time for questions, but you can um, uh, directly message her um, after, the, after the talk. Um, with that, um, I'm going to be giving the next talk, and I think my talk actually dovetails well with what Chippy just talked about. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And Theo, uh, would you mind taking, uh, keeping time, keeping on schedule? Let me share my screen here. All right. Can everyone, can someone uh, tell me they see this, the, my screen? 
Yeah. Yes, that's okay. good. Excellent. Great, thanks. Okay, well, well, thanks. Um, and like, like I mentioned, I think uh, the, the work that we're doing in Oregon actually, I think complements what Chippy just talked about pretty well. Um, what, what I'm gonna do today um, for the next 20 minutes is talk about some of the work that we've been working on the Upper Deschutes Basin, um, the area um, um, above Lake Billy Chinook and several uh, lakes and, and reservoirs in, in the area uh, where we've been basically trying to compare satellite imagery with in situ data that we've been collecting uh, during the, the spring, summer and fall. Um, as, as was just mentioned, um, so Jimmy was talking about Sentinel-2. We've been working with Sentinel-3 data or at least the, the products derived from Sentinel-3 uh, related uh, through the Siam project. Um, We've been, uh, so again, the, the, the pixel size on the Sentinel-3 satellites are, are, are a bit larger, about 300 meter uh, pixels, but we, using uh, the, the, um, the process data, we can uh, come up with cyanobacteria abundance, um, that, because the, the spectral shape imagery that's used uh, focuses on phycocyanin. Um, we, um, you know, it, it, the data are somewhat pre-processed, um, so to take care of uh, atmospheric correction, but we still have some, some issues, the data that we're using with some, um, uh, interferences from shoreline or, or snow ice, but we've, we've chosen to include those in some of the, the satellite uh, analysis we've been doing at DEQ just for exploratory purposes to get people on the ground to go out and take a look at, at, at locations. Um, just as a background um, for the larger Siam project, um, there's been a lot of work done over the past several years. And I think Amali is gonna talk about that uh, in, in, uh, in uh, about uh, um, an hour or so, um, but um, there are it seems to be pretty good correspondence from the products from Cyan with uh, Bloom or Bloom advisories across the U.S. Um, but what we're interested in in Oregon is how can we use uh, the Cyan data within specific areas or specific um, um, systems to help uh, identify, predict, and monitor uh, sign bacteria blooms. And so um, within the effort to shoots, this project that we initiated um, in 2019, uh, we wanted to uh, send, test the capacity to use satellite imagery uh, to uh, identify, predict, and monitor cyanobacteria blooms. Um, we're doing that by comparing satellite-derived estimates to cyanobacteria that we um, um, acquire um, through, uh, uh, through NASA um, at a pretty regular interval uh, with in situ data that we've been collecting through um, SONS and, and grab sampling at a series of, of lakes and reservoirs in the Deschutes over the past three years. And then ultimately, uh, we want to determine how we can use satellite imagery in, in a combination of, of field measurements or in situ data to help identify factors that contribute to blooms so we can better manage them and address the blooms in the, in the future. Um, just uh, as an overview for the, the project area, when I, when I said I mentioned the, the, um, uh, the project area, and this is a screenshot. We actually have a, uh, an application that we've been developing within Oregon that processes the satellite data and displays this on a, um, uh, almost real-time basis uh, that we hope to release to the public in the near future. We, we've, we've been working through our IT to get this done, but hopefully it's gonna be coming out pretty soon. Um, but uh, essentially um, the area that we're working in um, includes Lake um, Odell and Crescent Lake, which are the original uh, uh, systems used in the, uh, in the project. We have expanded over the past several years. And I'm gonna talk specifically today about Crane Prairie Reservoir, uh, which we uh, started sampling um, last year in 2020. And then also this year, we had the opportunity to expand the work to Lake Billy Chinook. Um, we've also done spot sampling on, on Davis Lake, uh, Wiki Up Reservoir, and also Lava Lake, but I'm, I'm not gonna discuss that information today, or those uh, data we collected there today. Um, just to give a snapshot um, with, with the uh, kind of, in terms of spatial temporal conditions that we experienced um, over this, this time of monitoring, uh, I wanted to give us kind of a screenshot, just some visual images to show the, the conditions. So Crescent Lake was originally, uh, we, we chose that because there hadn't been a history of cyanobacteria advisories, and it generally has been regarded as, as a, an oligotrophic or ultra oligotrophic uh, system. Um, and and that, that held through, uh, as you'll see when the data we present, held throughout our, our this, the past three years where we, we did not see any uh, uh, detectable cyanobacteria blooms either in the satellite or in situ data. Uh, within Odell, Odell has a history of blooms, uh, pretty regular blooms in July um, each year. Although this past year, we actually didn't see a bloom, which I thought was, was pretty interesting. But in 2019 and 2020, there were pretty intense blooms about the third week of July through early August, which we captured uh, both of the satellites and in situ. And, and those, were, those were toxin producing, mostly Dolopospernum um, dominated blooms that produced microcystin at some fairly high concentrations. Um, and then again, mentioned we've expanded to Crane Prairie beginning last year during the COVID year, which was a bit of a challenge because we had to sample them within one day timeframes. 
Um, but Crane Prairie uh, exhibits a pretty wide range of conditions, um, ranging from early season blooms, uh, well, early season clear water uh, to blooms in, in late July. And then this past year, there was a persistent bloom uh, that you can see in the lower photo there from the 15th, where we had clumping of, of, of surfaces, which I think if we identify this correctly, it was Dulcus burnum and, and Gloia trichia that we identified through some image analysis to the USGS. Um, and I'll come back to this clumping issue later on as we talk about comparing the in-situ with the satellite information. Um, we also had the chance to expand to like Billy Chinook uh, this past year, and we were able to put SONs um, in, in the, both the crooked arm and also at, at the selective water withdrawal uh, structure within Billy Chinook, just to get a record. And we, we, um, we had that in place from April through October of this year. Um, so again, just showing that, you know, uh, we have a wide range of conditions, both temporally and spatially, that we were able to capture over the past three years. And again, this is ongoing, so we're hopefully continuing this in the future. Um, so what we've um, done in terms of the methods, um, again, um, starting in 2019, uh, from about the spring, uh, well, 2019 was actually in June, but, but generally from mid-April uh, to um, mid-October, at least in the past two years, uh, we've been uh, conducting field sampling um, within, uh, within these water bodies. Um, we've placed uh, um, data sons at fixed locations um, at the, at, within each system just for, um, for security and consistency and, and the ability to telemeter data, which we did on Odell this past year. Um, and with these SONs, we're able to collect uh, chlorophyll A, phycocyanin, uh, dissolved oxygen, pH, and temperature uh, at 15 minute intervals. So we have a lot of data that we're sorting through right now. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, we also collected biweekly data on cyanotoxin, uh, microcystin specifically, and nutrients, uh, beginning with total nitrogen and total phosphorus in 2019, uh, um, but expanding to all forms of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, as well as uh, forms of silica, which we think is important for diatom blooms um, in, in, the, in the lakes early in the season. Uh, we also collected vertical profile sampling data in 2019 and 2020, uh, that should be 2021. Uh, 2020 was uh, a co the, the COVID year where we couldn't uh, do anything uh, more than a day at a time. Um, I say we collected those data, and I know there's going to be questions about the, uh, these data, but um, I'm not going to have time today uh, to present that information. We, we have some uh, turnover times uh, for data release from our laboratory and, and just frankly time to analyze the data, but we're bringing grad students on to do that in the future, so hopefully that'll um, come out pretty soon. And then ultimately, we're, we're taking these data and we're comparing this, uh, these, these, this information with satellite instruments of uh, cyanobacteria abundance that we uh, derive from the Sentinel-3 satellites. And, you know, again, the Sentinel-3 are, are relatively coarse, and, and each of the, the systems here are, qualify as uh, under the, um, um, the, the, the um, uh, spatial requirements uh, for uh, estimating cyanobacteria abundance. Um, but the, the, the benefit is that the return time is fairly high, is, is quite frequent, um, one to three days, one to two days, one to two to three days, depending on uh, location. Um, and just to get what that, that looks like, um, here's an image from um, Odell uh, from this past, uh, Odell Lake from uh, 2020 to ca that captured um, um, through the sign the sign application, the, the bloom and both the spatial distribution um, and uh, the time series of where the, where the bloom occurred. And, uh, I don't have the timestamps on this. I know these blooms can move sometimes based on wave action uh, throughout the, the day, um, but nonetheless, it, it did seem to do a pretty good job capturing um, uh, the cyanobacteria bloom uh, that occurred on, on Odell, and we'll see that with the, the in-situ data. And just for a um, uh, point of reference, um, where I've got the mouse pointer here is where we had our sawn located attached to Sunset Cove, which we thought would integrate across the water uh, column. So. Um, with that, let me just jump into some data to present um, really quickly here. Um, so on, the, on this graph here, um, these two graphs here, what I'm, what I'm showing on the um, x-axis is I've converted dates into Julian day, uh, just so we can compare across years. Um, and, and just for reference, this uh, 100's about uh, late April uh, to 300, which is the end of October. Um, and so I've got Crescent uh, Lake and Odell Lake, um, first plotted here because we have three years worth of data. And again, on Crescent, uh, across all three years, we saw no real evidence, at least based on the satellite information, of having blooms. And I've also uh, included a dotted line uh, for the 100,000 cell mark that the WHO has listed as, a, as an advisory level. We don't have in Oregon uh, an advisory level for uh, cells per mil anymore, uh, but this is just for more information purposes. Um, on Odell, as you can see, we, we did capture these um, 
uh, abundance bloom uh, uh, these these bloom events that occurred both in 2019 and 2020. And, and this is again, I should also mention that these are expressed as a as lake level or water body level averages of all the pixels, uh, just for for ease. But we can calculate many different types of statistics, uh, both spatially or or daily um, within the uh, the water bodies. And that that also is going to present a, is also presenting a challenge of how we compare with in situ data uh, as a as a prelude. Um, yeah, so just to compare, um, so again, um, this is the satellite information. And then if we look at the continuous monitoring for phycocyanid, which again is at one specific location, uh, one meter deep within these water bodies um, at what we think are integrated um, locations, we can see that um, just from visual evidence, it looks like the, there's a pretty good comparison between the, the monitoring data and the, the in situ data. So that gives us some, build some confidence that, um, it seems to be uh, comparable. Um, it becomes a little bit more of an issue when we looked at other water bodies though. So here is, here's Crane Prairie Reservoir, and this uh, is showing 2020 and 2021. This is the satellite imagery. And, and what I wanna point out here is um, for one, uh, a little bit sparse in, in 2020, but there, there, there was uh, a bloom both, uh, and we can confirm with the in situ data in, in late June um, of, of last year. And there was also again this year in 2021. Um, th uh, this year, however, there seemed there was a more persistent bloom that occurred later in the year uh, within Crane Prairie, and it got pretty, um, pretty, um, let's say nasty, I guess, in terms of scum levels. Um, however, um, um, I should, I guess, I should mention this: that there weren't any cyanotoxins that we detected actually in these samples um, uh, from when the blooms were occurring. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, qualitatively. It looks as though that Crying Prairie, uh, the in situ measures and the satellite uh, measures are comparing somewhat. But as we, when we get to the more statistical comparisons, you'll see it kind of breaks down. But at least qualitatively, it does seem that, that the, the satellite data and the, the monitoring data are, are comparable with one another. Uh, and then lastly, here's, here's Billy Chinook. And um, I've been struggling with how best to express Billy Chinook because there are three main arms. And I've, I've chosen to do a lake level average. Uh, even though we're monitoring two different arms, uh, we may change this in the future. But within Billy Chinook, um, again, there was a um, appeared to be a, a pretty large spike uh, about uh, late June within Billy Chinook, and then a persistent bloom that occurred uh, up till recently, up till through September, which eventually it's it's um, oh, crashed. And if you look at this compared to um, the the monitoring, we had um, a monitoring device at Cove Palisades um, State Park. Um, at the docks there, as well as the selective water withdrawal feature. Um, there's some correspondence, but um, it's um, maybe not quite as clear cut. And, and, and I'm realizing that these are, are different units and, and different statistics as well, based on, on how we're comparing them. So I guess the bigger question then is, you know, I, I'm kind of qualitatively saying that these, these look like they're, they're matching at least pattern-wise when the blooms are occurring. How, how well are, are the, um, the measurements uh, on um, in the field uh, corresponding with uh, measures from the satellite, and you know, Maybe ideally, 30, you know, it's going to be thirteen ahead. minutes are up. Then was that thirteen oh, minutes are up? Oh, okay, great, cool. I'm, I'm getting close to being done, so thanks. Um, well, you throw it all together, and it's not doesn't look great. But um, this may not be surprising, considering we've got multiple sites, multiple years. So really, this should be more of a linear mix effects model approach. And I've started to, to work on that. And when you can look at individual lakes across time, Odell, although the, it's not um, great, there does seem to be better correspondence across years. And it does seem like when phycocyanin values are high, the maximum abundances are high. Uh, this works for Odell. Um, it does not work very well for Crane Prairie, at least for the two years that we are looking at. And I think this may have something to do with the clumping of cyanobacteria at the location where we're measuring um, the phycocyanin, which um, I'll show in just a little bit, some other uh, data for that. Um, 2020 was also maybe not great, but there was some evidence that the, the cyanobacteria abundance corresponded with the phycocyanin. And, and actually in Billy Chinook, um, here I'm showing the crooked arm versus uh, the, the lake level, and it seemed like it worked pretty well. Um, what's interesting too, is I mentioned we took water quality data. So I was kind of curious, well, how does some of the water quality data correspond to the satellite and in situ measures? And pH, uh, the maximum daily pH um, seemed to be a pretty good correspondence both the satellite and in situ measures, except for the in situ measures at um, 
uh, Crane Prairie, which especially in 2021 was all over the map. The other sites, once once maximum daily pH got above nine, um, it seemed um, that it um, um, was pretty consistent with both satellite, high satellite estimates and high in situ uh, measurements. Um, same thing with Billy Chinook, I should mention. We only have one year worth of data to, to show that though. Um, so, so just some takeaways thus far, since we have a lot of data to sort through and we're still kind of working through this. Um, the temporal patterns of satellite estimates um, and of, of uh, service measurements, uh, if I could say, correspond well with each other within individual water bodies, uh, um, or correspond with each other in individual water bodies. Um, but the, the correlations between satellite estimates and the field measurements seem to vary by water body and possibly by year, especially within, um, um, uh, within Crane Prairie. Um, again, this is part of the issue that I'm working through is taking water body, water summary, water body summaries that are taken at one point in time and average spatially versus point measurements that are ever uh, that are taken at one location and average temporally. Um, and there's also uh, potential issues with monitoring equipment differences per year when you have different maybe calibration curves, which I need to look into a little bit more detail, even though we have a, kind of a standard process to correct for that. Um, but one thing that was I thought was kind of interesting is that um, I'm wondering if, if using some of the, the water quality data, say pH or a DO, which I did not show, um, a minimum daily DO could be useful in helping direct how effective a site is at, at measuring phycocyanin in situ uh, um, in terms of um, how well it corresponds with the satellite information. I'm still kind of working out the, the exact reasoning for that, but I think it's still pretty interesting that it corresponds with one another. Um, as you can imagine, there's still a lot of work to be done in this basin, and that's why we're trying to get some grad students um, to come on um, and, and work through these data. We have um, a lot of nutrient data that we're still processing. We have some information on cyanotoxins. We have uh, an opportunity actually next year to work with the USGS to do some uh, species compositions. And actually a master's student, Victoria Avalos, uh, is finishing up her master's thesis doing some species composition work from 2019. Um, but the idea here is to continue work in the, in the upper Deschutes. Um, we want to expand not just in the resolvable water bodies, but potentially also to looking at non-resolvable water bodies within the system too, because there is some indication that high cell counts, even like say in uh, like Lava Lake or in the Green Lakes Basin, they seem to correspond well with some of the high cell counts in the Sentinel-3 satellite data. Um, we want to expand this across Oregon, um, as we touched on briefly a little while ago about resources allow, and then also ultimately looking at how different uh, bottom-up versus top-down factors may interact within these systems to control blooms, uh, whether that's nutrients, temperature, or, or some food web dynamic that, that's occurring. Uh, with that, a lot of people who have been contributing to this work, it's been very useful. I've listed some here, and I apologize if I've missed any. But with that, I think I've got some time for questions, Theo. Yeah, couple of couple of minutes um, now. Can I? Um, I'm not seeing. I'm gonna. Uh, can you see if anybody has hand up? I'm not seeing that. Uh, I'll I'll stop sharing. I think I, I should be able to do yeah. that here. So okay. you've got your hand up. Uh, well, I, I can ask a question, but I didn't mean to do that. Uh, uh, it looks like I think Stewart's got one here. Uh, yeah. Water entering Billy Chinook from Atolius versus Crooked Arms has been at least ten de Fahrenheit degrees Fahrenheit different. And the metolius being spring fed never really heats up. Um, and qualitatively, having grown up recreating there and never seen blooms in the metolius arm, does it make sense to integrate the entire lake? So that's a good question. And so I think we are going to probably try to break out the arms with some different spatial layers here um, in, in, um, over, over, this, um, over the winter. Um, I will note, however, that um, looking at some of the imagery, I apologize for not having this up, that there are blooms that occur on the metolius arm. Especially, especially recently, within the past 10 years, which corresponds with some changes in, in the dam operation. And that's um, so. been known. The Forest Service has been sampling at uh, Perry South there. Yep. And yep, we've we sampled at Perry South too. That's yep. where there's micro systems. So the, I don't know that toxin has been seen in the other arms where there's a lot more green stuff, but Perry saw, South has. Yeah, we, so just preliminarily, we saw some toxin. Um, there... Um, uh, we, we saw some toxin in, in the crooked and, and main channel, but it wasn't above threshold levels for OHA. But um, as Aaron points out, there are blooms and, and they tend to be toxic, as you, you just mentioned. So. Yeah. Uh, are there any other hands up? Don't see any. Huh? No. So that you you were admitting that uh, clumping in Crane. I sampled there in two thousand um, seventeen, maybe. And saw that it was a phenazomenon, and it's a bit yellowish, like like your picture had. And um, what I, I noticed um, 
filtration of the, the, the amount of um, mucilage that cyanos produce can be quite variable. And, and sometimes for water treatment plants, it's a problem as, as diatoms can be. Uh, if there's too much mucilage, you won't get filtration. One way to control that is since they're, they're, sulfate, they're, they're acidic polysaccharides uh, is through pH or ionic strength. And so I've seen that in the lab. If you modify those, you can, you can, you can say, speed up the, the filtration rate. That stuff from over there, that filtered in, like in a snap. It was uh, not something I've ever seen before. It's almost like it's, it's electrostatically uh, um, uh, um, interacting. And those clumps, they're, they're like sort of like excised often. And you can break them up very easily, but they will reform. So it's a phenomenon, I believe, if it, if it was the same the year you sampled as the year I was there. Well, we, we sent it off to the USGS, I think, and um, I think um, um, Barry Cohen had sent some images back showing that it was, uh, there was a lot of Gloria trichia, there was... Um, well, yeah, there was Gloria trichia there at the same time, but that's, that's, that doesn't, I've never seen that clumping. A phenomenon is earlier in the reservoir, so that, I mean, earlier in the year usually. This was an odd year with the heat though, which is mm. kind of awesome. Yeah. It, it, we, there, we, there might be something interesting with the water, uh, comp the ionic composition or the pH. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Norm, we're going to have to move on to the next yeah. talk, but yeah. feel free to contact me over the chat. Um, so let me, uh, yeah, let's move on. Um, and I believe Alyssa uh, Payne and Kelly Fry are up next. So uh, Alyssa um, or Kelly, take it away. Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Okay, are we good? Does that look good? Yep, I can see it. Cool. Yeah, I can see Alyssa, it. I'll let you take it away. Yeah, awesome. So we're continuing on the theme today, it seems like. Uh, so hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for having us present today. My name is Alyssa Payne, and with me is Kelly Fry, and we are with Clark County Public Health located in Vancouver, Washington. The focus of our presentation today is explaining how we're using satellite imaging for early detection of harmful algal blooms as a part of our seasonal swim beach monitoring program. So next slide, please. To start off, I'm just gonna give you guys a quick overview of our monitoring program and activities. So between Memorial Day and Labor Day, we provide water quality information for designated swim beaches by routinely monitoring for E. coli and we sample any lake weekly that has had a report of harmful algal bloom for cyanotoxins. During the E. coli advisory sewage release or toxic algal bloom, we work with lake managers to post advisory signs, issue press, release, issue press releases, and coordinate posts to our social media pages. We also issue weekly email newsletters to HOAs, lake users, kayak and paddle board rental companies, along with vet clinics informing them of current advisories. Uh, next slide, please. Which brings me to my first point of our monitoring program. We heavily rely on lake users and citizen scientists to report harmful algal blooms to us. Once reported or observed at a water body, we sampled the lake for cyanotoxins, microcystin, and anatoxin A every Monday or Tuesday. We continue weekly sampling until the bloom dissipates for two consecutive weeks. When toxins are detected above Washington State's recreational guidance of eight micrograms per liter for microcystin and one microgram per liter for anatoxin A, we will issue a warning or danger advisory. We only elevate to danger where we do not recommend any contact with lake water when we have received reports of illness or animal deaths and or the bloom is covering multiple access points. The flaw within our monitoring program, however, is that if blooms aren't reported, this process and monitoring and outreach and warning the public doesn't begin. Next slide, please. So furthermore, as many of you guys have also mentioned, um, blooms are really, really hard to predict. <laughs> with increasing temperatures attributed to climate change and high levels of nutrient pollution within our waterways, these factors make HABs more likely to form, but still really difficult to predict when and where a bloom will occur since they have such great spatial and temporal variability. An example of their variability, variability can be seen below. So these photographs were taken at the designated swimming area at Vancouver Regional Park on the west shore of Vancouver Lake at 8 a.m. when our staff were collecting their E. coli monitoring, collecting E. coli samples, and at 1 p.m. when staff were collecting samples for cyanotoxin testing. 
At 8 a.m., you see no visible scum in the water, and at 1 p.m., there is a dunk scum covering the whole beach. So this variability makes it difficult for our staff to always know or catch a bloom, as it sometimes feels like. And it's really hard for then to the public to notify us that a bloom is present so that our monitoring and our outreach can begin. So I'm going to hand it over to Kelly to discuss how he utilized cyan data to help us better predict harmful algal blooms at this unique lake in our community. All right, thank you. Uh, so going off what Alyssa was just discussing, a great tool that um, we've heard about a couple of times um, in this conference so far uh, is called uh, Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, or just Cyan for short. Uh, it's currently being developed to aid in predicting HABs. So this is a national multi-agency project with people from the EPA, uh, NASA, NOAA, and USGS all working in collaboration with uh, the ultimate goal being to develop some kind of early warning indicator system to detect algal blooms in freshwater systems. So we hope to use this to detect blooms as soon as possible before they become an even bigger threat to human health. Uh, and there's really a lot of interesting science and mathematical modeling behind this project. But the main premise is that cyanobacteria have unique pigments that can be detected and measured with these special satellite instruments. Uh, this is a very new technology with a lot of research uh, certainly still to be done, but it is a very promising tool that Clark County hopes to implement in their swim beach program. So just some background on Vancouver Lake, which was the lake that we focused on for this particular study. So it's a very shallow lake. It's located directly west of Vancouver, Washington. It only has an average depth of about three to five feet and then a maximum depth between 12 and 15 feet. And over the past several decades, the nearby area around Vancouver Lake has undergone lots of suburbanization, which has contributed to elevated uh, pollution levels, which does include nutrient pollution. So this has made Vancouver Lake uh, very eutrophic. So harmful algal blooms are constantly occurring during the summer and fall. It is a popular destination for lots of recreational activities, including swimming, kayaking, hunting, fishing, competitive rowing, uh, and sailing. So there's a lot of potential for human exposure to these cyanotoxins, which makes it a really important lake that we wanted to focus on in this uh, project. And then it also has a designated swim beach, like Alyssa was saying, where we monitor for E. coli between Memorial Day and Labor Day. So the EPA has developed this web-based platform called the Cyan app that will allow anyone to access the data that is collected through the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network. So here on the slide, I have just a couple of screenshots that show the functionality of that app, uh, of the web app. So on the left, you can see the three locations where we routinely sample when there's a bloom present. So on um, the Flushing Channel, the Shilapu Wildlife Area, and then the Swim Beach. And then on the right, you can see those three locations pinned on a map of Vancouver Lake. And then in um, the circles on the left again, it shows you the uh, estimated cell count from the satellite. Um, at those three sampling locations, and it also tells you how much that value has changed since the last time the satellite captured an image of the lake. So it's a really intuitive and user-friendly way to monitor the presence of cyanobacteria. Uh, using Cyan, we were able to get access to data starting back in May 2016 all the way through July 2021 to when um, this project ended. So during that range, there were a total of about uh, a little more than 400 days when the satellite picked up some kind of cyanobacteria presence on the lake. Uh, it is important to note that currently Vancouver Lake is the only lake in Clark County from which this type of data can be collected, um, which goes back to the, um, the pixel size, which I'll discuss um, in a few slides. Um, so that was the only lake that we looked at here. Uh, so then for each day when the satellite did detect cyanobacteria, we recorded the cell count at the swim beach, the flushing channel, and then along the coast of the Shilapu wildlife area which you can see these three red X's on the map here. And then we also recorded the maximum cell count on the lake and use that in some of our calculations as well. Uh, now, even though we only had data uh, for 400 days, there are probably many more days when there was some measurable amount of cyanobacteria. However, things like uh, cloud cover and even wildfire smoke on those days made it almost impossible to capture an image that really gives any useful data uh, so that definitely does pose an issue for the consistency of using this tool. And next, we use uh, historical records based on actual site visits that Clark County Public Health staff made 
throughout um, these years, 2016 through 2021, uh, when the bloom was present, when they were monitoring. Uh, and then we um, put those two, put those days into the category of either bloom present or no bloom present based on those site visits. Um, and then we compared those to see if the satellite data could be verified by in-situ observations. So in general, obviously we expected to see higher cell counts on the days when there was a bloom, which would give us evidence that the satellite imaging is a useful tool for figuring out when a bloom has formed. And one of the current limitations right now of the actual uh, Cyan app is that it really only has data going back to 2018 for some reason. So because of this, we had to use uh, CDAS, which stands for C Data Analysis System, which is uh, just a program that we use to access older data. So this slide gives an example of the output that CDAS gives and how we were able to use it to carry out this study. So on the left is an image from uh, January 4th, 2020. And then on the right is an image from August 7th, 2021, which was during an especially bad, bad uh, bloom season in Clark County as a whole, uh, as you can tell from all the red and orange. So it gives a really pixelated view of Vancouver Lake, and then each pixel has its own cyanobacteria account associated with it. And then it's also color coded. There's not a legend on this image, but um, the brighter reds and oranges correspond to higher cell counts. Um, and then, so we only looked at the pixels in which our three sampling locations fell on this previous slide. And then, as I said before, we also found the highest cell concentration throughout the entire lake for each day uh, when we had data. Uh, so moving on to some of the results that we found. First, we just plotted the cyanobacteria cell count trend for each year uh, from 2016 to 2021. So just 2016 is shown here, which really only showed one major spike in cyanobacteria around the beginning of August. <clears throat> and then 2017 was a somewhat similar pattern. And then in 2018 and 2019 and 2020, things kind of start to pick up. And then what data we did have for 2021 up to about the end of July. So from this figure, you might just assume that the frequency and severity of algal blooms is getting worse each, each year. And while that has certainly been the case for these past few years at Vancouver Lake, the factors that make blooms more likely, especially increasing temperatures from climate change, those occur on a much larger time scale than just six years. So it can be risky to assume that there is a causal relationship just by looking at this data. Uh, it's definitely gonna take several more years of data to determine if there is a trend of increasing bloom frequency. So really the main thing to see from this figure is the seasonality of algal blooms. Um, so cyanobacteria counts were shown to be higher from the satellite during the summer and early fall months, which coincides with our monitoring season when we test for cyanotoxins. So it was good to see that the images being taken closely match what we see in the field in terms of uh, when exactly blooms are occurring. And then this next figure goes back to what I mentioned about categorizing each day as either bloom present or no bloom present. So on the x-axis, you can see the average cell count, which ranges from zero all the way up to 2.4 million cells per milliliter. And then on the y-axis, it shows the percentage of days when the bloom was present versus when no bloom was present. So for example, on the days when the average cell count was between zero and 200,000 cells per mil, uh, the very first column right here on the left, there was no bloom present on the vast majority of those days, according to our site visits. And then as the estimated cell count increases, the proportion of days when the bloom was present also increases. And then uh, once the average cell count gets above about 1.6 million cells per mil, there was a bloom present on essentially 100% of those days, according to our site visits. So this is really useful data for us to have because let's say we check uh, just the most recent Cyan app data and the cell count is uh, somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 million cells. That essentially means that there is about a 75% chance that the bloom is present at Vancouver Lake. Uh, and this, knowing this, it would convince us to send staff to check for scum and then collect samples to test for toxicity, um, all without receiving any notifications from the public, which is how um, this program currently works. And then I was also able to create a logistic regression model through some simple coding in R. So it looks really complicated, uh, but what it's able to do is just tell us the probability that there's a bloom at Vancouver Lake given the average cell count. So you can use the data directly from the Cyan app for a specific day to find the cell count at those three sampling locations. 
uh, calculate the average of those and then plug that value in for x right here uh, to figure out the probability that a bloom uh, is currently present. So then moving forward, the Swim Beach program is really helping to implement this kind of data into their have response protocol in some kind of meaningful way. Uh, we can set a threshold cell count and then be automatically notified when the numbers are above this value. And then we would respond by doing a site visit uh, and then testing for cyanotoxins if there is a uh, scum present. This would allow for earlier detection of algal blooms and also less reliance on notifications from the public. And this all supports our overall goal of issuing advisory sooner to better protect public health. Uh, something else that like users might be interested in is something kind of akin to a Smokey the Bear fire advisory sign, where we use that day's cyan data to assess risk uh, and then communicate that risk to the public in a way that is easy to understand. Another way we can use uh, the data is to go back in time <clears throat> and see if there was an instance when cyanobacteria counts were unusually high, but no bloom was ever reported. Uh, and this would kind of support our messaging to the public about the importance of notifying us if they see what may be a uh, harmful algal bloom. <clears throat> there are certain few, certainly a few drawbacks to this satellite technology. Uh, first of all, the resolution at which the satellite captures images limits our use of this tool on the smaller lakes in Clark County. So at the moment, the 300 meter spatial resolution doesn't really give any consistent data for other lakes in Clark County. Additionally, uh, environmental conditions such as cloud cover and wildfire smoke can make it difficult to capture an image for every single day. Uh, because of this, we probably won't ever be able to solely rely on this method for detecting blooms. Instead, we're thinking of this just as more of another tool in our toolbox for identifying blooms as early as possible. So we're still very much rely on the public to notify us of potential blooms. Uh, and that's why on the Clark County Public Health website, there's a lot of educational info on harmful algal blooms so, so that citizens can be more aware of their significance and why it is so important to report them. Uh, and then really close to being done, one of the really cool things about Cyan is that it is publicly available for anyone to access. Uh, so this link can take you to the Cyan web app, which works on most web browsers. And then if you have an Android phone, you can scan this QR code to download the app on your phone as well. And then with that, thank you so much for your time. I'll open up if anyone has any comments or questions. Excellent, thanks. Thanks both uh, with you and, uh, and Alyssa. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. Um, there's one posted by Rich Miller in the chat. Um, are macrophytes present within your study pixels? And do you think they have any impact on your relationship between satellite-based cell counts and observed blooms? Hmm. Oh, that's uh, a great question. Question. Oh, sorry, Kelly. Do you mind if I answer? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, so that's a really great, great question. So when we also sample for cyanotoxins, we pull a duplicate sample and we look at it underneath in a microscope to look at the genuses of cyanobacteria and other things that we're seeing present in the water. And so a major and that's a program that we started in 2020. So unfortunately, we don't have historical data to compare for our kind of cyan data. But we know that starting in 2020 to 2021, the majority of abundance that we're seeing is potentially toxin producing um, genuses of cyanobacteria within our samples, um, which is unfortunate, um, but definitely possible for previous years. And I guess I don't really have a good way of knowing. So that's a great question. Great. One thing that we've I've noticed um, with within Oregon, um, we've been um, uh, looking at uh, Sturgeon Lake. It gets consistently high cell counts, and I think you know, in terms of morphologically and similar hydrologic processes, they seem to have formed similar. It's, it, form, it seems to be similar to Vancouver Lake, although we don't get really reports um, from the public about Sturgeon Lake, and even though we've contacted the manager out there, but. I'm kind of curious, we may do some more uh, reconnaissance or sampling next year out there. So. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely interesting to see. And and again, we're lucky that Vancouver Lake is a heavily recreated lake. So yeah. usually we do get reports. However, some people are like, 
I thought you already knew about that. And so that can always also be frustrating. Um, and so encouraging people to reach out to us is always kind of our best way of getting the information out. Great, thanks. Um, Sherry has a question in the chat. Uh, has anyone been using uh, phenology or wildlife cams to take daily photo, uh, take a daily photo that could be up, get up, gets uploaded to the cloud for almost real time visual uh, evaluation? Uh, so beach cameras have been on my budget wish list for a long time now. And so something that I've definitely been interested in, I'm sure you guys have seen other cool um, kind of examples of that as well. Um, we have looked into using beach cameras. I think wildlife camera is also very interesting, but we have gotten pushback from the park agencies that manage those areas on recording and faces and um, how would that be used. So we haven't pursued that yet just because we have gotten concerns from parks in those areas on how that footage would be used. Um, but I'm definitely very much wishing we had a beach camera budget because that would make it a lot easier for people to readily check online before they go out, before they go kayaking on what the current conditions are. Great, thanks. Um, well, in the interest of time, let's move on to our um, final talk. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Alyssa. It was really great, um, really thanks good information. Everybody. Um, and then, so yeah, so Amalia Handler from the EPA um, is last in our session, and she's going to be talking about uh, satellites, uh, sound bacteria, and microsystem toxins. So um, with that, um, take it away, Amalia. Thanks, Dan. Let me... Oh, we, we can see the presenter view. Swapped. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. At least defaults that way. Uh, Thanks, Dan, and, and thanks everyone for hanging out until the end of the day. Um, uh, that was a great talk, uh, Kelly and Alyssa, to, to set up uh, what I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, further building on, on Cyan. And um, I really appreciate Dan uh, asking me to come to this session and for lining up the talks the way that he did, because I think it's gonna work out quite nicely. So once again, my name is Amalia Handler. I'm a postdoc with the Environmental Protection Agency. I'm based in Corvallis, Oregon at the Pacific Ecological Systems Division and the Office of Research and Development. And I've been very focused on trying to think about how we can use the cyanobacteria assessment network data that was so nicely highlighted by um, Dan and Alyssa and Kelly before me to um, build tools and understanding around the patterns and drivers of harmful algal blooms across the contiguous US. So what I'm gonna talk about today is a project where we're using that satellite data to predict uh, which lakes across the US are most at risk um, from cyanobacteria and microsystem toxins. So our motivation for this work was to uh, try and figure out if there was a way for us to use this really, really rich spatial and temporal information that's captured by these satellites to assess the risk of cyanohabs uh, across space in the U.S. So uh, thanks to the previous talks, I don't have to go too, too much into uh, the cyan project, um, but I will be a bit specific in that uh, the, the cyan data includes some of the more contemporary data, which was covered a bunch in, in um, the previous two talks. Uh, the project that I'm presenting on actually uses the earlier period of data collection that was from the MARIS satellite that was collecting data between 2008 and 2011. Uh, and this is uh, similar to the other talks in that um, this imagery had quite large pixel sizes at 300 by 300 meter pixels. And uh, in addition, for the purposes of this project, we set a minimum number of pixels required to three. So that's about a minimum size of about one and a quarter square kilometers. So this is really only capturing some of the largest lakes across the US. But even with those constraints, we are capturing about 2,200 lakes across the contiguous US, which is pretty exciting. The Maris mission had uh, a return interval of two to three days in general. We took those images and used them in a composite format uh, so that 
we preserve the maximum value from each pixel within a given week. And we do that in order to reduce the overall amount of missing data from week to week due to things like cloud cover um, and things like that. And then another important difference to note here is that um, the Cyan project has a lot of trouble resolving uh, pixels that are on the land and water interface. And so those pixels are removed for the purposes of this analysis, in addition to pixels that are adjacent to the land. So this is really capturing the center of these large lakes. So as uh, many folks have illustrated, this data is incredibly rich in spatial and temporal information where a lake may have between 10 and or excuse me, between three and over 10,000 uh, pixels and then weekly images over a four year period of time. So in order to get a handle on kind of an integrative measure of what the severity of cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms are in these lakes across the US, we use this uh, spatial temporal mean of the bloom magnitude. And this is just a mean over space and over time where basically we're taking all the pixels within a given lake. And I have a few different time points on this figure on the right of Odell Lake. Um, and we're summing the value associated with each of those pixels. We sum across all of the time points and then we sum across all of the months that we're interested in. And for this particular analysis, we just focused on the um, the June through uh, September period of time. And then we take all of that and normalize it by the lake area so that we can compare across uh, very differently sized lakes. And so we get a figure that looks like this. So uh, again, this is averaged over um, that June through September time period and from 2008 to 2011. So this just gives you a sense of across the US, uh, among these satellite monitored lakes, kind of what was the bloom severity in this period of time. And you can see that the scale here um, is four orders of magnitude. So we have really had a tremendous amount of spread in terms of uh, algal bloom severity in these lakes. And so we saw this map and said, wow, there's a lot of variation going on here. Can we harness some of this to try and figure out which of these lakes might be at risk for uh, exceeding um, certain types of thresholds associated with cyanobacteria actually on the ground. And so to uh, find some field data to couple with our satellite data, we turn to the National Lakes Assessment, which is part of the National Aquatic Resource Surveys conducted by the EPA to assess the physical, chemical, and biological condition of water bodies across the contiguous US. Here, we're including two surveys that were conducted in 2007 and 2012. And this involves field crews visiting about a thousand lakes across the contiguous US in each of those surveys and collecting a single sample during the summer, so sometime between June and September. Uh, the lakes included encapsulated a quite um, a broader range of sizes than those included in Cyan, uh, but Happily, these surveys include a few algal metrics, including uh, microsystem toxin, cyanobacteria cell density, and chlorophyll A concentrations. So we took this field data and we looked for uh, which of these lakes that were assessed in the national lakes assessments were also resolved by the cyan data set. And so the map on the left is showing that spatial overlap where we had about 210 lakes that were resolved by the satellite and also captured in one of these two field surveys. In terms of temporal overlap, it gets a, a, a bit less um, uh, a bit less nice. So we have uh, data collected in the National Lakes Assessment in 2007 and 2012, and that bookends the period of time that that cyan data was collected between 2008 and 2011. Um, but we did a lot of work to basically show that the, the spatial variation across lakes across the US was much larger than the temporal variation through time uh, in this particular period. And I'm happy to talk more about that if folks are interested. So to compare these two data sets to each other, we took that mean bloom magnitude metric uh, for that cyan data between 2008 and 2011, and then compared that to 
the combined 2007 and uh, 2012 National Lakes Assessment data. So what does this actually look like? Uh, that's what these box plots show. So on the uh, horizontal axis in both of these figures, we have that mean summer bloom magnitude, that's the satellite derived bloom magnitude metric. And then on the uh, vertical axes, we have the national lakes assessment data. So on the left is cyanobacteria in cells per mil, and on the right is the chlorophyll A concentration. Then the points are colored by the microcystin concentration um, with different shapes symbolizing the different years of the, in which the survey takes place and the gray color showing non-detect, which at this, for these surveys was 0.1 micrograms per liter microcystin. So that's a lot of information, but just to step back, what I want you to take away from this figure is that as the blue magnitude increases, so that number on the uh, horizontal axis, we tend to get higher amounts of cyanobacteria in those field samples, higher amounts of chlorophyll A concentration, microcystin tends to be detected more often. And when it's detected, it tends to be at a higher concentration. So we said, okay, how can we quantitatively capture this information uh, to try and use that blue magnitude to figure out which of the lakes across the US are, are most at risk for um, having experiencing cyanohabs? And so at this point, what we did was uh, to demonstrate the usefulness of our approach, we uh, took the approach of using demonstration thresh thresholds. So we used a lower threshold and a higher threshold just to illustrate that our method can be used for uh, different levels of a particular response variable that, that um, a particular uh, stakeholder group might be interested in. So for um, each response variable, we have those two different thresholds. And for the purposes of time, I'm gonna uh, probably only be able to go through one of these in, in, in any level of detail. So apologies in advance, but I'm happy to, to talk more with anyone if, if you would like more information. So also set up wonderfully by the talk before me, we took a logistic regression approach. It had been a little while for me since I had done this analysis. So if uh, you need a refresher, a logistic regression is where you predict the probability of, of having a particular event. So in the previous talk, it was whether or not a bloom is present. In the example that I'm gonna show you here, it's whether or not a particular threshold associated with uh, an algal, a cyanohab metric, is exceeded or not. So in this example, I'm taking one microgram per liter microcystin and I'm categorizing field data based on whether or not the observation exceeded or didn't exceed that threshold. And then on that horizontal axis, again, is that mean summer bloom magnitude as measured by the satellite data. And so what we get from this analysis is the probability of exceedance based on a given bloom magnitude as measured from the satellite. So we did this analysis for all three of those national lakes assessment metrics, microcystin, cyanobacteria, and chlorophyll A. We did it for both the lower and higher thresholds. We also developed these models separately for the 2007 and 2012 field surveys, and then also on a combined data set from both surveys. And uh, uh, for the purposes of time, I'm just gonna show the results of that combined data set. So once we developed these models for each of our thresholds and each of our metrics, we wanted to apply those models to all of the lakes that are, that are monitored through Cyan. Again, this was only a subset of about 200 lakes that were both sampled in these field surveys and monitored by the satellite. But we feel pretty comfortable extrapolating these models to all 2,200 lakes that are, that are monitored by the satellite because the range of blue magnitude values from the subset is pretty close to matching the range of uh, all the lakes that are included in the satellite data set. So we felt pretty comfortable about that interpolation and extrapolation. So the results here, I am showing uh, maps with each of the locations showing uh, a location of a satellite monitored uh, lake within the US through the Cyan project. In particular, we're looking at the microcystin results. On the left is the lower threshold, that microcystin at 0.2 micrograms per liter, and on the right 
is the higher threshold at one microgram per liter. So I'm gonna take a second just to go through the color fan here to give you a sense of what these results actually mean. So along the top of that color fan is the probability that that lake is going to exceed that particular threshold, the one that's on top of the map in any given summer. And as our uh, uncertainty around that estimate or the confidence interval, that's the 95% confidence interval on that probability estimate, as that increases, so we have less certainty, uh, that means that the color will desaturate and lighten. So looking at one of these dark red points, that would be a lake that's between 75 and 100% likely or has a probability between 75 and 100% of exceeding the threshold uh, and between zero and 20% confidence interval on that estimate. So that's how to interpret this figure. So that's a lot of information, but stepping back, what I want you to take away is that most of the points on this figure, so most of the lakes that are, are monitored by the satellite, tended to have low probability of exceeding these thresholds over that summertime period and uh, across that 2007 to 2012 time period from which these data are derived. But we do see some hotspots for um, locations that have a much higher probability of exceeding these thresholds. So we were really excited about this approach because it shows us that the satellite data can be used to uh, determine which of um, the lakes that are monitored through this satellite program might be vulnerable to exceeding thresholds, especially as they relate to microsystem. So we also developed these models for cyanobacteria at the 20,000 and 100,000 cells per mil. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have too much time to go through these, but uh, generally the spatial patterns were quite similar with um, most lakes having relatively low probability of exceeding these thresholds with uh, some localized hotspots, especially around the upper Midwest and around the Gulf Coast that are more vulnerable to exceeding these thresholds. And the same for chlorophyll A. I just want to zoom in for a second to highlight that even in these locations where we have these localized hotspots, such as in Minnesota and Louisiana that I've singled out here, just in this situation of, uh, for the threshold of uh, 0.2 micrograms per liter, we can have lakes that are at very high probability of exceeding these thresholds, basically adjacent to lakes that are at very low probability of exceeding these thresholds. So that indicates that while there are some kind of regional factors that are leading to certain clusters of lakes being more vulnerable to cyanohabs, there's a lot of local variation here. And so we're really interested to dive into that next to think about what's driving this variation in these patterns and harmful algal blooms across the country. So to wrap it up, uh, we're really excited about this because it's an approach to help identify lakes that are at risk for cyanohabs. And uh, we, that our approach is flexible with respect to the threshold that you wanna set, provided that you have field data in the range of the threshold that you're interested in. Um, and that's really exciting because it's another uh, step in the direction of using satellite data to help assess water quality risk. Um, and then in terms of where we're going forward, we're really interested in examining some of these regional versus local drivers of cyanohabs. And then we also have a more recent national lakes assessment that occurred in 2017. Uh, that was the same year that there was a cyan project uh, data collection. So we're really interested to look at that as well. So with that, I'll thank you so much for your attention and for sticking around until the very end. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thanks, Amalia. Yeah, that was great. Really interesting. I'm always interested in seeing the updates to the, the work you guys are doing. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Give a second for folks to compile questions or raise hands. Theo, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, Amalia. Um, for the um, your predictions, the map, you have a lot of negatives. And I'm thinking that that probably we know um, on a county basis, you know, where there are bad, bad actor lakes. So um, it might be more in interesting to know which lakes we could sort of ignore. So those negative ones, rather, rather than pinpointing 
the hotspots, which we're, I'm suggesting we perhaps know about. So have you have you tested, so you've taken some of those negatives here, the, the ones that, that you're, you're predicting are not much of a risk and checked out whether there have been uh, reports or advisories or anything and, and how that uh, corresponds? Yeah, that's a really good question. We would love to, to have that kind of data uh, to do a, a evaluation of, of how well this model performs um, with respect to uh, actual reports of, of cyanohabs. At that point, we don't, we don't have access to a sort of comprehensive data set. That's something that we've thought about doing in particular states, for example, that have really nice um, easily accessible reporting uh, portals, but um, a, as I'm sure some of the other speakers here can attest that those data sets, um, while they can be really, really useful, they're not always necessarily a great validation data set because the intensity of the monitoring and how often the monitoring happens can actually vary quite a bit. Um, but I think that it's, you bring up an excellent point in, in that um, this uh, approach may not um, only serve to identify lakes that are at very high risk, but could also help identify uh, which are the lakes that maybe you don't need to worry about as much. Um, and so that's how we hope this, this approach might be used is to help as sort of one tool to figure out um, how to set monitoring priorities uh, on the ground for a, a given region. Have you looked at the Washington State database? They they have uh, all of those lakes there are going to be in that database, I bet you. And they, I mean, they do have variable amounts of varying amounts of um, uh, uh, temporal density for sampling, but they have a lot, a lot of samples. That that'd probably be the place to start to do that comparison, I think. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. I'll write that down. Happy to take other questions. If yeah, no, I, I, I can ask questions for FR, but I don't want to take up time. But um, so I'll yeah, um, kind of build on Theo's question. Um, so uh, is the NLA designed to characterize lakes within you know, nested spatially, the spatial hierarchy? So could you um, express this more as like different region, like different uh, lake types within a specific region as opposed to individual water bodies? Um, and then maybe zoom it, like have it some sort of hierarchical system because you could look at certain regions saying, well, certain regions, the lakes aren't going to be an issue, but within a certain spatial, you know, like within ecoregion X and or the Willamette Valley ecoregion, then you need to focus a little bit more on, on, on um, looking for microcystin or, or blooms. Yeah, so the, the NLA more broadly is designed to, it, it's a, it's a stratified uh, sampling system to design to sort of take a slice of uh, representative lakes across the US and assess their physical, biological, and chemical condition in order to extrapolate those results to all water bodies across the US within particular size classes and certain, certain constraints and only the contiguous US. So that's a really powerful data set for that process. Unfortunately, because we're only using a subset of that data, the 200 odd lakes that overlap with the cyan data, that precludes us from, from using that power of the NLA data set to go to all water bodies across the US. But I take your point that um, we could look at, for example, ecoregion or trophic status, or um, there may be other sort of, uh, um, groupings of, of lakes in this data set where it might be interesting to look at uh, what is the array of sort of risk levels within a particular set of lakes. And that's something that we haven't looked into, but I think could be really interesting. I would not be surprised at all if this overlapped with a lot of the other topics that we've talked about already today, reservoirs versus uh, natural lakes, uh, nutrient status, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's something that we're definitely interested in looking at going forward with uh, examining some of the drivers of these patterns. Thanks. Yeah. 
Well, just as a time check, we are four minutes past five, um, but uh, we don't have anything scheduled after this. So we may have time for other questions, uh, either for Amalia or potentially other speakers if they're willing to hang around. Um, otherwise, we can you can contact the speakers um, after the meeting um, through the contact. Um, uh, contacts provided on the OLA website. Um, and this session has been recorded if people want to either share uh, this when, it when it's released or revisit any of the talks. Well, I'll hang out for a little while longer in case anyone asks any questions. But um, with that, we can conclude the session. And just as a reminder, we'll have uh, the next session is going to uh, be next Wednesday, the 10th. We have a um, uh, we have the OLA business meeting uh, from is it two to three or two thirty to three two thirty to three o'clock. Um, and then after that, Desiree two of us will be be hosting uh, a session like physiology and management from three to five in the afternoon.